Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira thumma amma ba'd May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you among those who will be called to perform hajj with ihsan ya rabbil alameen And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide you all with hajj mabroor and sa'i mashkoor May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send you all to al-baytul haram and bring you back safely ya rabbil alameen We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you May Allah accept from you your, the best of good deeds and come back forgiving all your sins ya rabbil alameen First of all, a disclaimer over here, and a quick disclaimer. Since this year, the system is completely foreign and new to all of us, we are not going to be discussing the logistics, which means how they're going to pick you up, when they're going to pick you up, how they're going to drive you there, how they're going to get you here. All these logistics, we have no idea how they're going to be. You guys are going to be experimenting that and give us the report after you come back, inshallah, to Baraka wa ta'ala. It's all new this year. Truly, we don't know, because I've heard some people so far that book certain uh, uh, packages only to realize that their walk is 45 minutes from the Haram. And they thought they're going to be actually in Jabal Umar, not too far from the Haram. Some, they said that they booked their, their, uh, their, their package because mashallah was actually a good package, but it's still reasonable in price, only to realize that the reason why it was actually inexpensive, because there's no Medina included. And they were kind of a little bit felt confused because they were landing in Medina airport and they thought that they are going to be staying in Medina for some time only to realize that no, there is no stay for them in Medina. So they're going to be going straight to Mecca. But here's the thing, they don't have a ticket or information for tickets that takes them from Medina to Mecca. So there are a lot of logistical issues here that I can't answer. So don't ask me these questions. Are we going to go by the train, by bus? Is it going to be grouped together? Who's going to be our, our group guide? All these things. Allahu Ta'ala A'lam. I'm here to help you, inshallah Ta'ala, navigate through the actual performance of Hajj itself, the rights of Hajj themselves, bin Allah Azza wa Jal. And we try to give you the, the information so that, inshallah, that you have the proper knowledge. You can make it, inshallah, easy for you, bin Allah Azza wa Jal, and those who are around you. There'll be some resources we're going to provide for you, inshallah Ta'ala. And as we speak, We'll be we'll having these QR codes for you if you'd like to ask any question, you can just scan it and ask your question. Keep it there with you until, inshallah, that we're ready to start having that part of the, of the uh, presentation, the QR session, inshallah. Ta'ala. Now, obviously, um, some of you maybe have the experience of going to Hajj. So how many of you are going to Hajj this year? Raise your hand if you're going this year, inshallah. Ta'ala. You've been selected, alhamdulillah, rabbi amin. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you, rabbi amin, make it easy for you. How many of you guys have been to Hajj before? Raise your hand if you've been to Hajj before. Okay, so a lot of you are coming for the first time. And may Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for you. Those who have gone for Hajj for the first time, if you've been to Umrah before, raise your hands. So Alhamdulillah, so you know how it looks like so far. The only thing that we need to start working on right now is how we get you from Mecca to Arafah, Arafah, Mina, Mina, these places and so forth. These are the places where no matter how much you are going to be learning about, it's not going to be the same when you are there, in the heat of the moment, when you have all these thousands of people surrounding you. It's going to be a little bit technically difficult sometimes to navigate, especially right now, with the way that we don't even know how it's going to look like. The group is going to take you, with buses, all these things. So there will be a lot of uh, um, uncertainties here. So I'm going to remind you with a simple message over here. Hajj is all about testing your, te your, your, uh, uh, your patience to the maximum limit. And if you think that you're a patient person, wait until you go to Hajj. Hajj is probably going to test you beyond your limit. So make sure, make sure to keep your cool all the way until you come back again home. Because anything in between can ruin your Hajj for you. So you guys need to be very, very careful not to lash at these guides or these drivers or these people because I think they're going to be as confused as you are. Nobody knows how it's going to work out, so we hope, inshallah, for the best. So let's begin with that, inshallah ta'ala. So first of all, let's test your knowledge about Hajj. I want you to grab your phones out and scan these QR codes, please, and give me the answer. Grab your phone out, scan this QR code, and give me the answer. What is the most confusing thing to you about Hajj? Bismillah. Let's see. Those who are watching with us online as well, feel free to scan it. And if you would like to answer, make sure to put a different color for your uh, uh, padlet, please. So we recognize that you're coming actually or answering from outside of the city or the state. Yeah. 
So when you start studying Hajj and you think about Hajj, I'm sure in your mind there's a question that you need an answer for. What is the most confusing thing about Hajj to you? What would it be? Let's see what you have here. Interesting. Okay guys, keep them coming. You can also see this, the answers on your phone as well too. Good to know that. Now as you guys post in your answers, let's see some of the answers that we got so far. So here, what we're hearing right now, what we're seeing, is number one, the different madhab, how to practice Hajj. Like Hanafis, Shafi'is, do we do this, do we do that? How long, how short, all these things. Can I leave, you know, uh, uh, Muzdalifa before midnight, after midnight? Why and all these kind of different opinions. The second thing somebody says, most confusing thing to me about Hajj is Hajj itself. Like from the beginning to the end, it's all confusing. So I hope, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put guide in your heart that will make it easy for you to understand. The steps to follow. How do we do that step by step? Many different opinions from different scholars can become very confusing to know what to do. The significance of each night, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, we're gonna talk about it, inshallah ta'ala. We also have uh, uh, people say about the diff different fiqh and rulings, uh, the footwear specifically for men, we can explain that. The different steps between Mina, Arafah, and Muzdalifah, we can explain it to you. Uh, Ar Rami, Rami al Jamarat, we told the Jamarat. How many times and how are the stones, how many stones per, per time? The sequence of the rituals themselves, the rights of res and, or restrictions, the rules and restrictions actually of Hajj, the obligatory versus recommended practice of Hajj. When should we get out of Ihram uh, on the 10th day? We're going to explain that, inshallah. Um, so, when to start, how to end, all these things. So, I guess basically it's all the same, uh, the same questions. We all look it into, inshallah, the sequence, the rules, and the ahkam. So we're going to explain that to you, inshallah ta'ala. The second question, get ready for a second question, inshallah. What did you do to prepare yourself for doing hajj correctly? Hajj is going to be in the next few days. You guys are going to be leaving soon. Scan it and give me the answers. What did you do, since you're going to hajj, to prepare yourself for that journey, inshallah ta'ala? Besides going to mutawuf, yani, dot com, right? Besides that. All right, let's see what you guys have here. So, Bismillah. Somebody saying, not enough. I already feel guilty. I'm going to hajj, not thinking that I have prepared enough for it. Um, research it, but still confusing with different madahab, different opinions. Watch Sheikh Omar Suleiman's step-by-step -step YouTube video, which is from 2018, actually was done at VRIC, the old building. You can watch that, inshallah, in details. Practice dua, a lot of dua, may Allah accept from you, Rabbil Alameen. Reaffirming my intentions, mashallah, that's very important for Hajj. Uh, read steps about Hajj, uh, read some Quran. Re I read some steps multiple times, watch Shaykh Omar as well too, Shaykh Hasr Qadi and others. Uh, made intention, made intention and, uh, and had faith, alhamdulillah, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it seems that many people, they watch the videos actually that's out there, which is part of the resource we would like to share with you. But alhamdulillah, since you know it, look it up, inshallah. I read a lot about Hajj uh, procedures online and what to take and bring. Mut uh, <laughs> no, Mutaw, I hope, I hope Mutaw did not ruin anything, inshallah ta'ala. Um, intentions and prepare physically, of course, and mentally for Hajj. And that's something people don't pay attention to, by the way. The physical preparation for Hajj. You guys are going to need to start eating healthier, seriously. You need to eat health healthier because you don't really keep using the bathroom over there frequently. Uh, second, you also need to walk and practice because there's going to be a lot of walking there in the hot weather. 
So therefore, you need to be prepared for that and dehydrate yourself all regularly and so on. Start walking, start exercising. You need that exercise when you get there, inshallah ta'ala. Last question, inshallah, for you. Just quick, the last question to test your knowledge. What part of Hajj are you preparing to focus on the most? So if you think about Hajj in your mind right now, one thing you would like to benefit from the most from that journey when you go to Hajj, what is that thing? Which part of Hajj is that? I think we're getting the wrong, wrong uh, uh, code over here. Are we getting the wrong code? Okay, give me a second. Just give me one second here, inshallah. All right. Okay, can you try this out now? So what part of Hajj are you preparing to focus on the most? Let's see what your answers are. Bismillah. So here we're saying Arafah, Arafah, they have Arafah. Most of you guys are saying Arafah, as you, as you can see over here. Some saying Dua, Alhamdulillah, some the Dua and Arafah. Some saying Umrah. I don't know if it's going to be a good idea to do multiple Umrahs uh, during Hajj time, but we'll see, inshallah. We'll talk about it as well, too. And the Adkar, Sunan. The rituals, inshallah, may Allah accept from Ya Rabbil Alameen. So let's prepare right now, since I hope everybody is here already, inshallah ta'ala, we can now start with the conversation with Allah Azza about the Hajj. Now this is actually the last one I want you to scan so far. This is for the, for the questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, just type it up, inshallah, to scan this. I'm going to be bringing this QR code multiple times in the presentation. But if you have any question, as we speak, you don't have to raise your hand. Simply type it up there, inshallah ta'ala, and when the time comes for the Q&A, we're going to be answering them for you, inshallah azawajal. Now. By the way, don't start asking your questions. I already started, received three questions already. <laughs> so let's go to the presentation first, and then you can ask any question you have in mind, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah. Before we start your journey, before we start your journey, we need you first of all to focus on the spirit of Hajj because I know a lot of people are anxious about what? How to do it right. I want to know how to put my ihram on. I want to make sure that I don't you know, mess it up. What if my period starts you know, this, this day or that day? Uh, am I, do I need to cover my face with a mask now that actually you, know, you shouldn't be doing that or not? Many questions in our mind. Before we get to the technicalities of Hajj, I want you to understand the significance and the essence of Hajj itself. That journey could be one in a lifetime journey for you. And especially if it's your first time, don't ruin it. 
Because usually first times are the most memorable moments. Make sure to do it right, inshallah wa ta'ala. So I'm going to share with you, I'm going to go through the aspects of Hajj, but from a spiritual point of view. Number one, longing for the divine. The essence of Hajj is truly to bring you back again and again and again to be in the presence of the divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah azza wa jal gave commission Ibrahim alayhi salam to build the Kaaba or rebuild the, the Kaaba again, so he, he made dua. قال فجعل أفئرة من الناس تهوي إليهم. He asked Allah subhanahu wa taala to bring people with good hearts to come to that area. That when he was speaking about his family, people with good hearts. Ya Allah, make the hearts of people inclined to that place. Make them go there, travel by heart. And then the other ayah when Allah subhanahu wa taala he uh, uh, he called us for Hajj. He said وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَةً Remember, when we made the bait, the house of Allah, the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mathabata linnas. The word mathaba means frequently for visitation. They come back again and again and again and again. And that's why when you see people go to Umrah, every time they're done, what do they say? What do they say? Oh my God, I want to come back again. Every few months you want to go back again. You go for Hajj and you keep remembering. Whenever you see the Kaaba, oh subhanAllah, that was beautiful. Oh, I remember when we did this. Remember when we do that. So we always want to come back again. So the first thing that you keep in your mind that you're going to go on a journey that will capture your heart. I hope so. And if your heart was not really captured by the sight of the Kaaba and the sight of the Hajj itself, then you need to start checking and cleaning your heart from now. Work on your heart from now. It's not about knowing how to do this or to do that as much as where is my heart? Am I going because I would love to be in the presence of the divine? Or am I going just to do a, a Hajj check? You know, just one of the five pillars of Islam, done, alhamdulillah, I'm good now. What is the intention? Make sure to focus on bringing your heart into that journey. That is the most important thing. You're going to carry with you luggage and, and food and clothes and so on. Carry the, 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 your heart with you into that journey, inshallah. Wa wa ta'ala. Number two, the essence of hajj. The essence of hajj is submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he described Ibrahim alayhi salam to us, after he raised the Kaaba with his son Ismail, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described us right now, why following Ibrahim's example is so important. He said, <coughs> he said, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلَمُ He said before that, وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِهَا نَفْسَهَا وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِهَا نَفْسَهَا means those who go far away from the example of Ibrahim, they fool themselves. Like if you deviate away from the path of Ibrahim, you, div you have de deviated yourself and strayed away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what was the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam? إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ When Allah said to him, Aslim, submit yourself, he said, I submit myself. No question asked. I submit myself. So hajj is all about testing your submission. What does that exactly mean? You are going to see things there that might not make sense to you. Like for example, why do we have to make tawaf seven times around the Kaaba? Why not nine? Why not ten? Why does it have to be this way, not that way? You're going to go up the mountains to run between two hills. And in mind, just like, why? Why do I have to do that? Especially the most, the most maybe for many people, the most confusing part of Hajj is actually Jamarat. When you have to carry in your hand 21, you know, papal stones. And then you go seven, three stations, each one of them you throw seven of these, of these stones. And every time you say, Allahu Akbar. But then just like, what am I exactly doing here? You think about that, it will test your faith. Literally. And that's why when it comes to Hajj, a lot of it might not make sense in terms of, you know, the mind, but in terms of the heart and the submission will make a lot of understanding and your heart will submit to it. And we're going to talk about each one of them, inshallah. But I just want you to understand that Hajj is going to test your submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hajj is about the legacy of Ibrahim and commemorating the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us in Ibrahim the example of submission. He said, build the Kaaba, I build the Kaaba. Uh, take your son to the desert, he took his son to the desert. Sacrifice him, I will sacrifice him for you. Do this, do that. Whatever Allah commands him to do, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was there because he believed and he submitted his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The submission of his wife, the same thing, when she was taken to the desert and she was asked to leave her son, she just looked back as she looked at Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, where are you leaving us? Is that what Allah asked you to do? He said, yes, it is. It's the last command. He said, go, go ahead. Allah will take care of us. That's submission of that lady. She has a baby in the middle of the desert, subhanAllah. The submission of his son, Ismail, when he was about to sacrifice him. 
And he told his son, look, I'm seeing in my, my dream a vision that I'm sacrificing you. He goes, my father, just do it. You'll find me patient, inshallah ta'ala. And they both submitted themselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he is the one who calls us Muslims. Those who submit themselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without that submission to the will of Allah azza wa jal, you will struggle with your ibadah. You will struggle with your heart. But if you bring your heart to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't focus on the results. I focus on one thing, being a good servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what the outcome is. So that's all about a house of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Part of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, we've seen this in this ayah, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghari dizaran inda baytik al-muharram. My Lord, I've left some of my offspring in the middle of nowhere, near your sacred house. Here's the irony here. When Ibrahim alayhi salam made this dua, he left Hajar and her son Ismail there, and the house was not built yet. There was no house. It was only the site. Just like the people who built their house in, in Silver Lee before Valley Rights Mezzo was built. Not to make that comparison yani, so uh, accurate. But just to give an idea, Ibrahim was visionary, alayhi salatu wasalam. He knew that Allah will, build, will ask him to build a house there at some point. And he was worried about what? The faith of his children. He didn't worry about provision, because he said, وَرْزُقُّ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Later, provide for them from the food. He said that later. He was worried about their faith and about, of course, their hearts. So therefore, their ibadah was the most important thing for him. I want you to understand this. Ibrahim had a vision. What is your vision about going for hajj? Is it just go about going to the obligation and finish it? Or do I have something as a legacy I want to leave behind? I want to go to hajj and change my life. I want to go to hajj. I want to become this person that I always wanted to be as a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to make commitment. What is going to be your legacy after you come back from hajj? Make sure to make that commitment, inshallah, before you leave. It's a journey of submission, as we said. Lifelong planning for yourself. How am I going to make my life all about submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not just temporary. No, all the time. Making sure that your halal provision is part of your journey as well, too. When it comes to going to hajj, carry less of the dunya with you. So I know with having cell phones in your pockets, good luck you know, focusing on your hajj. I urge you, when you put your malabas al-ihram there, when you go on that journey as much as you can, reduce your consumption of social media and all that stuff and so on. Some people, they go there just to document their event of I'm here, I'm there, and taking selfies with the Kaaba. Beautiful, mashallah. But this is not what you're there for. Make sure to reduce your carriage of this dunya with you when you go there. And also, pure consciousness. Purify this mind and their heart while you're going there for Hajj. One companion for the road if you can. You know, a lot of people when they go to Hajj, they look, who else is going? So you can make a whole team and a group, inshallah, we go together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from your Rabbil Alameen. Sometimes having one individual to be your partner on that journey is better for you. So that you can focus. It could be your spouse, it could be someone on that trip with you, or somebody else, whatever. Find someone that you can both team up together to wake each other up for Fajr. Making sure that let's walk to the haram, for example. Oh, I'm too lazy. No, no, come. Like, come with me. They will help you with that, inshallah ta'ala. When they start getting tired, you pick them up. And they pick you up when you get tired. Someone who will be a good companion for you on the road, inshallah ta'ala. Because that, rare, that road is going to be difficult. And you're going to hear a lot of whining, by the way. So prepare yourself. Please don't be one of those whiners, jama'ah. Okay, especially the guys who come from the West, mashallah, very entitled to air conditioning and, uh, you know, five-star food, mashallah. And whenever the food is not ready or this, oh my God, I start complaining. The service, the five, by the way, uh, customer service only exists in America. If you're going to try to complain about customer service and there, good luck with that. Doesn't even exist in Europe, jama'ah. <laughs> just so, this is just something here. The customer always right just in America. Once you move out of this territory, don't even try that out. So please make sure to keep that in your mind as you deal with the people, inshallah, there. Taking the higher ground, what does that mean? People that are going to push you, people that are going to shove you, people that are going to be disrespectful. It's not the time to put your ego there in that equation to win games and wars for you. That's not the time for it. Let the people just win. Not money, of course, but I'm saying about, you know, someone took your place, someone did, someone did that. Because if you're going to be stopping at, at every moment someone, you know, does something wrong to you, you're not going to enjoy your ibadah and your hajj. Take the higher ground, inshallah ta'ala. And parting with the loved ones is very important. 
I know that when we leave, we're going to leave so many of loved ones behind. Make sure to make to remember them in your du'a, inshallah ta'ala, and make sure to have a very good uh, farewell, inshallah, and parting with them, bin Allah Azza wa Jal. By the way, I put this picture deliberately for you. Do you guys see what that picture is? This is the, the, uh, uh, the bullet train they had actually 50 years ago. It used to move you maybe a few inches every few days. And now with the buses and, and the trains, we're complaining about the speed of our travel. They used to travel on the back of camels and walk in, subhanAllah. It takes them forever to get there. And still, it was an enjoyable journey. Making the intention. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'an in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu who said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Good deeds will be measured by your intentions. So I don't know what your intention is there for. Are you going there just to take pictures so you can document that journey for yourself? Are you going there to impress some people? Are you going there because you know what? I don't know, I just want to get over with it. Why are you going there for? Make sure to focus on your intention and purify your heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you, Rabbil Alameen. Let's talk about the ihram now. If you look at the ihram or what, this is not by the way, this is, this is called just a, a, a towel, really. When you put it on and make an intention, it becomes a haram. People they think this is the haram itself. No, this is not the haram. So if you put it just like this, it doesn't make you now يعني, muhrim, not yet. It's just a piece of cloth. But the haram comes from the word what? Haram or haram. When you hear the word haram, what comes to your mind? The concept of sanctuary. Sacredness. It's sacred, there's sanctuary, it's sacred, absolutely sacred right now. So therefore, what do you need to do? Once you put the ihram and you declare a state of ihram, you're declaring yourself in a state of sanctuary. You're not, not, you're not gonna say things you usually say them out of that sanctuary. You're not gonna do things that you usually do out of that sanctuary. You are gonna put yourself in a specific state of mind and state of heart, and even physically as well too. So therefore, when you put yourself in the state of ihram, as you do that and you make the intention to say, Allahumma, I, I, I announce or I, I enter into the state of ihram, when you say that intention, you're putting yourself in the service of the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we say, لبيك اللهم حج, لبيك اللهم umrah. Ya Allah, I enter in the state of ihram. Ya Allah, I enter in the state of, of hajj and umrah. So basically, you put yourself in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For us as Muslims, it's more like that monotheistic order. What does that exactly mean? Or monastic order. And the monastic order just like, you know, become a monk, temporary. All your mind is focusing on those next few days, on what? On just ibadah. Nothing else. What about food? You eat less, as less as you can so you can move on with your ibadah. What about luxury? I'm not about, you know, a thick mattress or this and that. It doesn't really matter here. So therefore, as much as you can, you need to make sure that you focus on, on, your, on, the, on the soul and the spirit of this ibadah. You're all about the ibadah right now. Also, submission to equality. You know, many people, especially in our time, Allah Musta'an, the subject of uh, 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 racism and, and inequality in societies and so on, and different classes, you go to hajj, if you really open your heart to it, you will see how hajj is like an, an equalizer. Everybody there wears the same thing, almost, during the, time, the, the, the days of hajj. Everybody there speak the same language. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Keep chanting this over and over again, over and over again. It's really a, an, an equalizer. And when everybody's wearing this, <laughs> unfortunately most likely it's made in China. Uh, so uh, when everybody's wearing this, they all become equal. You can't even tell who's the rich and the poor because there's no such thing as silk, yani, ihram, yani, right? It's no matter how expensive it is, it's still cloth, cotton, that's all. So therefore, it's an equalizer. So keep that in mind. When you go to Hajj, it's not about you're coming from America, you're better than everybody else, or flashing your, 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 uh, your passports of all these people. Put that behind your back. You're going there to humble yourself, to be in the presence of the Divine Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's also a symbolism of resurrection. I don't know if you will ever see that in Hajj. I have, alhamdulillah, the privilege of being there multiple times, so I used to uh, walk uh, during the time of Hajj from one place to the other one. I used to walk, I didn't like to ride actually. When you walk, if you ever get the chance to walk from Arafah on your way to Muzdalifa, one of the most beautiful sites that's breathtaking sites. I used to even walk from there, you go over the bridge, an overpass, I stop at the bridge and just marvel at the beauty of the crowd. You look to the right, it's all the way until the end of your site. You look to the left, they're coming from, from Arafah, all the way to the end of your site. 
Underneath you hear the people with different chantings when they say Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, you can tell these people are from Asia, these people are from Africa, these people are Arab, these people are the, 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 the tone of their talbiyah is so, so beautiful and so amazing. That sight, it reminds you of the Day of Judgment. Everybody comes out, walk into the same direction. They're like, literally like hypnotized, going into one direction, going to the Kaaba. On the way, they're going to stop in Muzdalifah and then Mina and then move on there. Also, they all wear the same thing, just like the shrouds. You, there's no pockets here. So if you're really going to do it right, there's nothing you carry with you except just your clothes, that's it. So there are no pockets, nothing you carry with you. A reminder, this is going to be a sight you're probably going to see. May Allah subhanahu wa make that sight easy for us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. At talbiya the word labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, is when you start proclaiming your hajj and making your intention uh, uh, verbally. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam wa adhan fil nasi bil hajj yatuka rijalan wa ala kulli dhamir yatir min kulli fajjin amir. Call them, make adhan, make call, call them for hajj, they shall come from all over the place. Subhanallah, the beautiful thing about this here is when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the order to Ibrahim alayhi salam, and you shall see the place for yourself when you go there. He told Ibrahim to mount one of the mountains there. He says, Ya Ibrahim, call the people to come for hajj. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, qala ya rabb, how am I going to be able to do that when I'm only one person? I cannot go all over the place. He goes, Allah told him, Ya Ibrahim, you make the call, we will deliver. You just make the call. It wasn't for Ibrahim to deliver the, you know, his voice, his son. But Allah subhanahu wa made his voice reach all around the globe for the people to start coming and perform hajj in Mecca from that time until this day, until the day of judgment. So that's a miracle in itself, subhanAllah. Um, and you're going to see, like I said, people that speak in the same tongue, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, and suddenly it just, it's, it's beautiful. You can tell from the tone and the, and, the, and the accents of people from where they are. But it's also beautiful, and it's all the same thing, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, and equalizer. Unifies the people even with, with one language and one on word. So can we try talbiya together, Jama'ah? I want you to try that out, inshallah ta'ala. Let's do it one time. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك. You guys are ready for it? I hope so. Practice this. If you don't know how to say it, I ask you to go online to one of those YouTubes and just choose one video and repeat with them inshallah تبارك وتعالى until you excel in the meaning of those words. Tawaf. One of the things also of Hajj that you're going to be practicing is doing Tawaf multiple times. So you're going to do when you come first to Mecca, when you finish from Arafah, and before you leave. At least you're required to do at least three times to do Tawaf. So in this case, uh, it's important to understand the meaning of it. SubhanAllah, the Tawaf is, uh, I don't know how it's going to look like right now, by the way, after COVID, just to let you know. Also some of the logistics. Because things have changed since then. Are they going to allow people to make Tawaf all, all down there? or only those who are wearing ihram, because during the COVID time, only those who are wearing ihram were allowed to be around the Kaaba. Any who was done with his umrah, they would be doing tawaf for the second floor or, or third floor. So I'm not sure about this time for hajj as well too. Are they going to allow the same thing? Or if you're done with your, with your umrah, are you going to be allowed to make tawaf around the Kaaba? So that's something that you'll, you'll see for yourself there, inshallah. What's the difference? The difference is that when you do around the Kaaba, usually it's supposed to be shorter, supposedly. But with the number of people right now, Allahu A'lam. Going, doing it from the second floor or third floor, you're going to actually take a, a longer way of doing it. Like it's take about 20, 25 minutes just to do one single circle. It's going to be quite a, a walk for people to do that. But here when it comes to tawaf, why do we even circle around the Kaaba? What's the essence of it? Some of the ulama, they try to understand what's the meaning of doing that tawaf seven times around the Kaaba. The number seven is significant. Because the, the, the heavens are seven, the earth are seven, uh, the, the day of, uh, of the week is seven. So seven is significant over here, in that sense. Now, but why? Allah Ta'ala We know that the Prophet did it seven times, and we're going to do it seven times. And when you do it seven times, why do we do something or circle around the Kaaba? The Kaaba in itself is the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 
The significance of the Kaaba is limited to what Allah taught us about it and what the Prophet taught us about Al Kaaba. However, when it comes to comparing Al Kaaba itself to the sanctity of life and blood, no, the life of believers is much more important than the Kaaba itself, as the Prophet said. We do not worship the Kaaba. Let me put it this way. Some people, they think of the Kaaba to be so sacred to the extent that they think touching it has some magical uh, uh, kind of like powers. Like their life is going to just be, alhamdulillah, perfect once they touch the Kaaba. No, it's not. Even if you wipe all your body there, it's not the same thing. So therefore, the Kaaba itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a sacred house as a symbol, symbol of the presence of the divine, and we do ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why seven? Why we do the circles around the Kaaba? So some ulama, they say, look, Whenever you circle something, it becomes what? The center of your life. It becomes the center of your life. So if somebody says, like, if someone loves their kids, all their life is about their kids. All their activities about their, their, their kids. Like they summarize everything they do in life about their kids. They become the center of their life. Someone makes their job, they become workaholic. Their job becomes the center of their life. Everything about their work. An activity they do, their computer, their phone. If you put something as a, circ- a center of your life, you're going to always be going around it. So therefore, it's better for you to put the Kaaba, the center of your life, as a symbolic thing, obviously. Also, when you circle around something, there's a pull, right? When you start circling something so fast, there's a pull. And that pull brings everything back into it, to the center. So if you keep doing around the Kaaba, no matter how far you go, I hope your Iman is strong enough to pull you back again there. It's a symbolic thing that brings you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the divine. The black stone. The black stone, there is some narration that it came actually from heavens. Allah ta'ala alam with the authenticity of that. But we know that just kissing the black stone, it was sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu when you do tawaf. Some people, they think kissing the hajj al-aswar or the black stone is sunnah altogether. No, it's not. The only, you only kiss al-hajj al-aswar or the black stone when you make tawaf around the Kaaba. So there is really no need just to, to, to uh, uh, win a moment to go and kiss al-Hajj al-Aswad just for the sake of it. It's part of making tawaf around the Kaaba. Besides, what you see here in this picture, obviously, the silver, the silver frame is not the Hajj al-Aswad itself. But the dark spot that you see, the dark space that you see inside, actually, is part of al-Hajj al-Aswad. And even al-Hajj al-Aswad itself, most of it is gone. You know, when people keep wiping and keep cleaning and put their hands on it and so on, subhanAllah, the erosion actually takes a lot of it. So now the actual, the actual material of Al-Hajj al-Aswad is just fragments, pieces that are now being sealed together in this whatever actually material that they use to seal it together. So when people put their hands over there, they kiss Al-Hajj al-Aswad, there are still pieces from the original Hajj al-Aswad from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and even before. What's the significance of that? The Prophet ﷺ did it. One time, Abu Khattab radiallahu anhu, as he was making tawaf, he stopped by Al-Hajj al-Aswad. And then he kissed it. Then he goes, Wallahi inni la alam. I know. You're just a hajar. You're just a stone. You're not going to help me. You're not going to benefit me with anything. I'm doing it only because I saw the Prophet ﷺ doing it. That's what he said. Also, when you do that, it's more like giving a pledge. Really. Like, I've been there. I kissed Al-Hajj al-Aswad. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Al-Hajj al-Aswad will testify for you on the Day of Judgment. So therefore, I want to make sure that I touch it if I can. I kiss it if I can. Now, during the difficult times of Hajj, obviously it's like an impossible mission to do it. But if you, alhamdulillah, have the, the, the energy and the power and you're able to do that around your tawaf, go ahead. Take the chance, inshallah. May Allah accept from you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. But in the process of making such a wonderful ibadah or act of good deed to kiss Al-Hajj Al-Aswad, don't commit a sin of pushing and shoving and, 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 and you know, fighting with people around you. It's not worth it. And we all see these wonderful scenes, mashallah, when people just go there for Hajj al-Aswad, they don't care about who's around them. They push with their hands and their arms, Allah musta'an. I had so many pockets ripped, you know, trying to go to Hajj al-Aswad. And just like Allah musta'an, like one, one guy was almost there. And he was pushed backward. As he was leaving, he was holding to anything. So he held my pocket and ripped it completely. And look at him, just like, la hawla, la <laughs> I'm not going to ruin my tawaf now. But please, don't put yourself in this situation. Stay safe. Yani, even Rasulullah, as he was making tawaf around the Kaaba during actually uh, his Hajjat al-Wada'. 
he didn't kiss Al Hajar Aswad directly because he didn't want to make it difficult for people. He had a staff in his, in his hand while he was on the back of the camel and he was touching it actually, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with that staff. Sallallahu Alaihi Al Multazam. You see this space here that you see in the picture? Al Multazam is usually not the space underneath the door of the Kaaba, no. It's actually the space, the wall between Al Hajar Al Aswad and the door of Al Kaaba itself. That corner or that actually space is what was called Al Multazam. Multazam, why? Because Min Al Iltizam, with someone, you know, kind of hold on to something. And it was called Multazam because there were some reports, although it is uh, disputable in terms of authenticity, that the Prophet ﷺ used to come and put his chest on, on that spot. And he would put his hand and his arm, like basically he would put his cheeks on the, on the Kaaba itself, and he would make a dua and cry. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be for people to do that, subhanAllah, but interestingly speaking, when everybody's focusing on Al-Hajj Al-Aswad, the immediate corner behind the crowd is usually empty. So sometimes during Umrah season, I don't know about Hajj for the ladies basically, but during Umrah season, they give specific timing for the ladies to come to Al-Hajj Al-Aswad. I don't know if they're going to do this during Hajj time, but if you see them calling the ladies, maybe you could take your chance, inshallah ta'ala. And for the guys, like I said, usually right after the crowd is an empty space. If you can catch that spot, and I did that multiple times, alhamdulillah, and it was easy to catch. Maqam Ibrahim. The Maqam Ibrahim is the station of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the reports of the Sunnah. The stone or the rock, the brick that, is, that was there was the actual brick that was used by Ibrahim alayhi salam as he was elevating and raising the foundation of the Kaaba. Why is that? Because Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was building the Kaaba, he was putting the bricks, you know, above until you reach, you know, your maximum height. But he wants to, right now to raise the foundation of the Kaaba higher. So what he does, he puts one under his feet and he steps on it and he puts one extra. So that's why it's called Maqam Ibrahim. And the Maqam is just, a, a, it's a brick. Today that brick, the same thing, the erosion took a lot of it. So therefore what they did, I believe they, uh, um, they covered it with, with silver. So it's now it's actually it's a silver, you could say, mold uh, that shows just the image, or not the image, the, the, the opening or the, 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 the print of the feet of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Not the actual print themselves, but at least what it says that it was the print of the feet of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It used to be, in the past, used to be attached to the Kaaba itself on the foundation level. That's how it was. But when the, the group of people, when the Islam grew, alhamdulillah, and more people started coming for Hajj and Umrah, the time of Umar al-Khattab to relieve the people from praying behind the maqam and creating a traffic jam and so on, he ordered for, for the maqam or the stone to be removed from that corner and to be put farther a little bit where it is today. And what you see right now in this in these nice, beautiful golden case and, and of course marble case, uh, you don't need to touch it. There is no actually any value in touching it or kissing it or anything like that. It's simply just to show you and remind you that the, 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 the true value of it is to, to remember Ibrahim السلام, was physically there. He was physically there and he was the one who raised the foundation of the Kaaba. Zamzam. Now what's the source of Zamzam? Allahu Alam. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a blessing and skip gushing and has been gushing for all these years. No matter how many people go to Hajj or Umrah, Jama'ah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi, Zamzam is always there. Never stop giving water. So therefore, do, as, do yourself a favor and drink from Zamzam as much as possible. And I know some of us might say, look, if I drink too much water, I'm going to be using the bathroom too, too often, so I don't want to keep living, living al-haram. Well, it depends on the weather, really. If it was hot, drink as much as you want. Trust me, you're not going to go to the bathroom. It all evaporates right away. You're just sweating it out quickly. But if, it's going to be, if you're going to be in your own hotel room, then that's something to worry about. But yeah, drink from Zamzam as the Prophet says, Ma o Zamzam lima shuri bala. When you drink Zamzam, lima shuri bala, which means you're going to get, inshallah, that what you make dua for. So as you drink, make a lot of dua for yourself, for, for your health, for inshallah, for your future, for your family, and for your loved ones. And by the way, even when you go to Medina, you will see that the, uh, these canisters and these containers also filled with Ma Zamzam. But I was told that Zamzam that you see in these actually containers, it's not 100% Zamzam water, which means it's also mixed with, with, uh, uh, with tap water, usually, so that at least they, they increase the volume. 
Otherwise, we won't be able to produce that much money, much actually coming out from the water well. As Saiba and Safa al Marwa, running between the two uh, uh, mountains of As Safa and Al Marwa, it's commemorating again the, uh, the life of the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hajar, when she left her baby in the, in the, in the valley. And she was not worried about the, ba the baby. She needs help, she needs assistance, and the baby was crying, and there's no water, nothing. So she went to the closest mountain in that area, which was Mount al Safa. You're going to see it there when you go there, inshallah. And by the way, nowadays, if you go to uh, Mecca, the Mount of Safa and Al Marwa, most of them are all, most of these hills are covered with marble. Barely a small part of it is still visible where you could see it. But the majority actually is, uh, is covered right now. And um, you're running between errands, just like Hajar was doing, trying from a Safa and look around, nothing there. She runs to the next uh, high, height, which was Al Marwa. She runs there and then she looks around, nothing. She comes back again to a Safa to be closer to her son, going back and forth, going back and forth in that journey. This is just a symbolic thing for us. We're running between errands. Our life is all about this going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at the end, who's going to provide for you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah, He proved to Hajar, no matter what she did, where the water came from, from underneath the baby that she was trying to save. Allah brought the, the water of Zamzam to gush from underneath the foot of the baby that she was trying to save, which means do whatever you want. At the end of the day, it all comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you take from your hair, it's also a symbolic thing. It's a sign of humbleness and humility. It's a sign of uh, um, kind of like transformation, like you're moving from one state to the other state. You're removing all the filth that, you know, and the, and the sweat and the dust and so on, like starting fresh. You want to start anew, you want to start fresh. So that's a symbolic thing as well we do when we shave our hair as we finish our, our Hajj and our Umrah. Arafah. Now that's a very special place. It's going to be a very, very long wait, just to let you know. From Duhur time all the way until sunset. And you're going to be going in the summer. What does that exactly mean? It's going to be a long, long day for sure. So you need to get yourself busy. Otherwise you'll find yourself checking on your phone and just you know, wasting your time. And maybe playing you know, a sugar rush probably. So therefore, make sure that you focus on your ta'a and your ibadah. Plan it. Plan your day. When you're going to be reading Quran? When you're going to make dua? When you're going to make dhikr? When you might take a nap? When you do this, when you do that? Just make sure that your day is well planned, otherwise you're going to lose the virtue of that day. Also, make sure that to understand that when it comes to Arafah, it's an individual experience. This is not the time to chit chat and get to know who else in the group, where you guys come from, which state you came from. Oh, I'm from Texas, I'm from this, I'm from that. It's very tempting. When you get bored, it's very tempting to start getting killing some time by socializing. This is not the time to socialize. You can socialize in Mina afterwards. But here in that particular day, it's an extremely individual experience. You need to focus on it very well, inshallah ta'ala. Besides, it's the last call. Because the Prophet said about, about Arafah, he said, Al Hajju Arafah. Al Hajju Arafah. Like the essence of Hajj is Arafah itself. If you miss it, you missed everything. So make sure to focus on this, make it a very individual experience. Take a corner somewhere where everybody else is busy and just get yourself busy with your dua and your adhkar, inshallah ta'ala. Al Jamarat. One of the most difficult things for people to understand, really, come to Al Jamarat. But it's really submission to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If I can just ask her to, uh, uh, to keep it quiet, please. Jazakallah. So submission to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because when you go there, you're going to be actually throwing the stones, really. But then you try to, try to rationalize it. There is nothing, no matter what you think you do, there is nothing other than the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did that. And we're doing it because the Prophet ﷺ did that. People that say you're stoning the devil. So some people, they take it literally that they're stoning the devil. So they really take it personal with that, with that uh, yani, the wall that they have in front of them. And they say, that's the shaitan himself. And they really take it seriously. I've seen wonders over there. We've seen shoes flying. We've seen 
rocks flying, we've seen bags and umbrellas, <laughs> well, I've seen everything. But something I haven't seen with one of my shaykh said to us that he saw himself. He goes, there was a guy, I was a guy actually, he was, uh, he took it so seriously, again, too personal, that he, he had a gun with him. He started shooting at it. <laughs> Everybody, doctor, just kind of like hiding themselves from it. Because this guy, he was taking it so seriously. And there was somebody, subhanAllah, <laughs> it's funny, especially the Egyptians, mashallah, are very funny. So there was a lady who was actually cursing at the shaitan in that moment. Like cussing and cursing, and bad mouthing the, the shaitan in that moment. So a guy, he was just on the side, he goes, Ya Ukhti, please, ittaqillah, you can't say that. So she answered him, she goes, what, is he your relative? <laughs> like none of your business, <laughs> let me curse at the shaitan. Right? But once again, we're not really storing the shaitan. It's a symbolic thing. Like casting the devil out of your life. That's what it means. You're like, Ya Rab, I'm just doing this with grace. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So it's not really about throwing the devil or anything like that. Just following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And finally here, reminding you for this part one, by the way, the reward for submission. Remember, when you do that and you do it right, what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala promised you. As Allah Azza says, uh, there should be a lot means don't try to um, uh, use bad language, no fusuk, no wrongdoing, no argument, uh, and no, of course, any kind of you know, intimate interaction with your spouse during that time. It is very important that you remind yourself to stay pure in mind, in heart, in intention, in practice. It's only for five days. As a matter of fact, not even five days, actually. The technical days for that is only two and a half days. The eighth, the ninth, and depends when you finish your tawaf on the third day. So two and a half to three days. That's what you need to keep focusing on, inshaAllah wa ta'ala. The Prophet says, if you do that properly, I promise you that you will come back like born again. You will come back like born again. Clean slate. Start for fresh with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make you among them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. If you guys have any question, scan this right now, please. Scan it, and then write your questions again. Now start, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So that was just part one, speak about spirituality of hajj. Now we're going to talk about technicality of hajj, inshallah ta'ala. All right, ready? Starting the journey of Hajj, inshallah ta'ala. Number one, the ruling of Hajj. What is the ruling on Hajj? Is it permissible? Is it recommended? Is it what? It's absolutely mandatory. Mandatory on every Muslim, man or woman, who is financially capable and healthy and able to go to the Hajj once in their lifetime. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah clearly, قَالَ وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ عَلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا People and pilgrims, they owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hijjul bayt, the visit to the sacred house. Man istata'a if they are capable of doing that, if they have the capability of doing it. Qal, wa man kafar, and he says, if you don't do that, then you committed kufr. Like equating that to be leaving Islam almost. Like if you deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the right to visit his sacred house once in a lifetime, then you've denied him subhanahu wa ta'ala his haqq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ghani an al alami. You don't want to come? Don't go. Allah doesn't want you to come. And that would be a shame, subhanAllah, that we keep, you know, always saying, I'm not going to go until they do this, until they do that. And you never get the opportunity to visit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, visiting Hajj once in a lifetime is the, the mandatory thing. Doing more than one, that's nafil. You can do it as you wish. A man heard the Prophet saying, Qala, in Allah kataba alaykum al-hajja fa hujju. Allah has made obligatory appointment to perform Hajj, so go to Hajj. So a man asked, Qala, afi kulli aman ya Rasulullah every year? The Prophet Sallallahu he kept quiet. The man asked again, Ya Rasulullah, please, is it every year? The Prophet remained quiet. And then he, the man, he insisted, Ya Rasulullah, is it every year? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Qala, qultu na'am la wajabat. If I say yes, it would become mandatory. and becomes hard on you to do that. Which means just keep quiet. I didn't say it's every year. But still, if you can, do it. If Allah blessed you with the capability and the ability, and now, now with a new system, you know, yeah, and kind of like win the, the lottery on it. Bismillah. May Allah accept to me, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Before you go to Hajj, few things I want you to keep in your mind. Number one, renew your intentions. 
renew your intentions. Why are you going there? Maybe before this presentation, I wasn't even sure why I need to go there. Now that I know what's the purpose of Hajj and all the rulings of Hajj, SubhanAllah, I really want to do it right. So focus on your heart. Meet friends and family and ask for forgiveness because you might never come back from that journey. Especially back then when people used to travel on the back of their camels, SubhanAllah. It's almost like for sure they go, they're not going to come back. Almost for sure they're not going to come back. So that's something uh, to, to keep and ponder over. You need to keep in your mind that you need to do that, inshallah ta'ala, and reach out to the people, of course. Knowing that you can communicate with them. But if you're going to go to apologize or seeking forgiveness, it's going to get worse. You know what? Just make dua for them. So basically do it the right, the right way, inshallah ta'ala. Pay all your debts if you can. Pay all your debts if you can. When I say all your debts, the immediate debts. But if you have long plan, long plan, for example, you have a, a, a payment plan on, on purchases and stuff like that and so on, then at least you pay enough money, like one payment or two payments, until you come back. Like some of you, for example, they plan after Hajj, they go to Pakistan, for example. So I'm going to be gone for another month. So by the time you come, you have now these bills not paid, and they are accruing riba, unfortunately. So why do you have to put yourself in that situation? Well, I don't have the money. Then why did you go to Hajj? Why did you go to Pakistan? They say if you want to go to Hajj, for example. So make sure to calculate right, inshallah, wa ta'ala. Prepare your will. If you owe people anything, if you, people, if you owe uh, somebody a uh, haq, financial specifically, write it down. If you love bless you with children and you have some money to leave behind, maybe you should put in that wallet to be distributed according to the Islamic inheritance law, for example. Keep that in mind, inshallah. So make sure to put your well before you leave. And this Thursday, inshallah ta'ala, here at BRIC, we have a workshop on how to write your well before you leave, inshallah. So we'd like to come and join. Come Thursday after Salat al-Maghrib here, inshallah ta'ala. Your dua book. If you would like to memorize few dua, few adhkar, this is the time for it. And if you haven't done it in Ramadan, go back to our recordings on YouTube, inshallah ta'ala. We have, alhamdulillah, about 30 days of Ramadan dua and adhkar, memorizing it, repeating it, pronouncing it, and also the meaning of it. Study them, take this list with you, inshallah, on the QR code. You can have them on your phone and memorize them on the way, bin Allah azza wa jal. The ihram clothes, make sure to have them. One of the logistics is that back then, groups used to give, the, give you this as you go, as part of your package that you paid for. Now, I don't know. If, are you going to get it or not? If that's mentioned as part of the thing that they give you when you arrive, so I'm not really sure. Uh, especially, especially, obviously, if you're going to be flying from here straight to Jeddah, meaning you're going to have to go there to do the Umrah right away. But if you're going to Medina, most likely they're going to give it to you in Medina. So I don't know what the plan is that you, you, you the package that you purchased. Your shots. Don't be surprised if they said, hey, where's the record for your shots? Make sure to have them ready with you, inshallah, wa ta'ala. Whatever requirements, legal requirements, review the paperwork. Because again, we don't know the logistics right now, what the rules are. So you need to check it on your own, inshallah, wa ta'ala. This is one of the resources Sheikh Omar prepared many years back. I want you to scan this. Scan this and save it on your, uh, uh, on your browser and your phone. Some of the technicalities in that, of course, in that, uh, in that paper or that document might be outdated because of the new system that we have in today. So, Allahu A'lam. But at least, at least, you'll have the preparation for the different days and different practices of Hajj, inshallah, and different reminders as well for you. Are you guys done with it? So, save it on your browser, inshallah. Got it? Okay, next. The most important provision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us when we go to Hajj that we have liman istata'a alayhi sabila, that you're capable of doing that, physically and financially. So He's asking us to carry provision with us. Carry provision with you. But what is the most important provision that you need to be carrying with you when you go to Hajj? He says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى You need to go and seek provision but the most valuable provision that you should be carrying with you on that journey is your righteousness and your piety. The piety of the heart and the righteousness of the heart. The most important thing. No matter how fancy your clothes are, no matter how much money you carry with you, how many credit cards you're going to be carrying with you, nothing is going to benefit you more than your akhlaq, your manners that will be springing out of what? The righteousness and the piety of the heart. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you that piety in your heart, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Because if you have it, 
You have everything you need in this life and in the hereafter, inshallah ta'ala. The months of day and the days of hajj. So when it comes to the month of hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-hajj ashhurum ma'lumat. Hajj is well-known months. What are these months of hajj? Shawwal, Dhul Qida, and Dhul Hijjah. Who knows which month we are in right now? In this, actually, right now, as we speak. Which month are we in right now? Ya Jama'a, which month are we in? Dhul Qida. We are in the Dhul Qida. Shawwal was right after Ramadan. Then comes Dhul Qida, which is almost about to be done right now. And then Dhul Hijjah will begin. What's the meaning of saying the month of Hajj? Meaning, no one is allowed to make the intention for Hajj until Shawwal comes. Like, if you would like to put your ihram on and make a journey to Mecca, you do it in Shawwal. If you do the niyyah with Hajj before Shawwal, you should be doing Umrah only. But you can make the intention for Hajj once Shawwal comes in. Obviously, alhamdulillah, we, we, we don't have to worry about traveling for months. So it's a matter of just a few hours in the plane. So that's why. It's easy for us to, to, to understand that principle right now. But the actual, the true and actual days of Hajj, where people start engaging in the activities of Hajj, are actually the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, 11th, 12th, and part of the 13th. Those are the days of Hajj. So people can finish Hajj in five days or in six days. We're going to talk about how and why. And the minimum number of days that qualifies your Hajj to be valid is what? The 9th the 10th, 11th, and part of the 12th, which means three and a half days, you can do hajj and be valid. But is it going to be the best hajj? I don't know. So the, the minimum to make it actually a valid and beautiful, graceful hajj, five days. Six days, an extra day. To keep that in mind, inshallah, we can explain these days what you're going to be doing these days. What types of hajj do people do practice? So three types of hajj. There's ifrad, which means singular, like I'm doing only one intention to do Hajj only. There is Quran when you combine Hajj and Umrah in the same intention and the same practice. And then there is Tamattu when you do Umrah and Hajj on the same journey. So how, let's explain that a little bit. Some people who arrive very very late. Let's say you're going to arrive on the seventh day of the Hijjah, for example, or the eighth day of the Hijjah. So when you arrive on the eighth day of the Hijjah, Hajj season already started. There is no need for you to do Umrah and go straight to Mina. Instead, what do you do? Just make Tawaf around the Kaaba and go straight to Mina. So in this case, you only do Umrah, you only do Hajj. And if you do only Hajj, you're not required to offer a sacrifice because you haven't done Umrah and then took a break and then you have Hajj over here. So for the Hajj, those who go to only Hajj, they're not required to offer the sacrifice. Okay, so what do I do? Can I do Hajj even if I'm arriving early? Yes, but here's the thing. If you, let's say, going to arrive five days or six days before the eighth of the Hijjah, for instance. That means if you make the intention to do Hajj only, if you make the intention to make Hajj only, you have to stay in Ihram all these days until you're done. So some people, they want to do that. They want to take the extra actual effort. So they start their Hajj and they make only intention of Hajj earlier. So as a result, they stay in Ihram. When I say stay in Ihram, doesn't mean the same piece of, uh, or two pieces of cloth. Now, they can change that, they can wash it. But I mean to be restricted in terms of their rules, like not cutting and trimming from their hair, uh, not cutting from uh, the, the, the fingernails, or even approach their spouse you know, with intimacy. They stay, stay away from all these things until they're done with their hajj. Al-Qiran, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came from Medina to Mecca for hajj, he practiced Qiran. Why he did that? Because he brought his, his, uh, his uh, sacrificial animal with him. So if you're going to be buying your sheep from Medina and you're going to haul it with you to Mecca, you can do Quran. That's, that's something you can do. So in this case, what do you do? You do Umrah, but you don't cut your hair. Instead, you go straight into Hajj until you're done. In this case, Umrah and Hajj, they actually combine together. As for the Tamattu, a Tamattu, which is what most people do for convenience, if you, they come earlier, so if you come three, four days to Mecca early, you do full Umrah, and then you cut your hair, and you remove your ihram, and you go back again to civilian life. Nothing, nothing was, whatever was restricted for you during ihram is no longer restricted anymore, all the way until the 8th of the Hijjah. Then you go back again to put your ihram on with the intention of Hajj and resume your Hajj duties. So because of that break, you are required to offer a sacrifice. 
Right now, I don't know if you guys, part of your package, you pay the voucher for the, for the animal. If you've done that, then you should make sure that you've done it properly. That's one thing. If you're unable, if you're unable to, uh, um, uh, to pay for that sacrifice of animal, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you that you fast three days in Hajj and seven days when you go back home. Three days to fast during your Hajj stay. Let's say you're coming in the second of the Hijjah. So you fast the third of the Hijjah, the fourth of the Hijjah, the fifth of the Hijjah, for example. Or even the sixth of the Hijjah, all the way until before Arafah. You have three days to fast, and then when you come back home, you fast seven days in place of paying for that, uh, um, the, the animal. Because maybe you would say, I couldn't afford it. You might say, Alhamdulillah, we can afford that. Well, trust me, some people they don't. But they still want to do tamattu'. So instead of uh, uh, paying for the animal, they actually they go and they fast these three days and seven days. And I did that when I was student in Medina. One of those years, I was broke completely. But I went to Hajj, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin. Didn't have enough money to pay for the animal. So we decided to fast the three days and seven days. The three days that we fasted, Wallahi, in, in, uh, in, in Mecca during the Haram time, during the Hajj time, I tell you what, I'd rather fast 100 Ramadan <laughs> than fast in these three days in Mecca during, subhanAllah, the, the Hajj season. So hard, so difficult. And it was in the summer as well too. Long, long, long day. We're almost like dead bodies the, the entire day. Just sitting there in the tent waiting for the day to finish. But uh, alhamdulillah, if you're blessed to offer the animal, then go ahead and do so. And don't worry about fasting these three days and seven days. Where do you start your Hajj journey? Now we're getting more practical, coming closer right now. So you start your Hajj journey from a place called Al-Miqat. Obviously for you, Alhamdulillah, you already started the journey right now by heart. But the physical journey begins when you arrive at some, one of the places called Al-Miqat. Al-Miqat is our geographical locations or geographical stations where people, they are obligated when they go to Hajj or Umrah, before they pass that line, they're obligated, they're obligated to make their intention for Hajj or Umrah. Like if you plan to visit, for example, uh, Mecca, and you have in your mind to do Umrah when you go there, inshallah ta'ala, then you cannot pass the Miqat. You cannot pass the Miqat without having the Ihram put on and make the intention. For the ladies, you have your clothes, of course, on, and you make your intention when you come to these, to these stations. When we say to come to this station, it does not necessarily mean to go at one of those spots exactly, but at the boundaries, anywhere behind the boundaries of these mawaqid, it should be okay. The farthest one, if you guys can see it and read it over there, the farthest one is at Medina. It's called Dhul Hulayfa. So that's about, you could say, 400 plus miles away from Mecca, the farthest one. So anyone comes from Asham, they come from Medina, or if we come from America, we stop in Medina, then you are obligated to make your ihram and intention before you leave Medina on your way to Mecca. There's this place called Abyar Ali or Dhul Hulayfa. They stop you there to make your intention. You pray to Raqqa and you move on. Sometimes, I don't know if you've been there to these places, they have actually showers and bathrooms and so on. So you go and you change and you get ready. Unless you want to do it from the, from the uh, hotel. So it's better for you to do it from the hotel actually, to take your shower, put your clothes on, and then you move on. If someone is coming from Yemen, they cross a place called Yalamlam. That's their Miqa geographical location. And as you can see, there are five of them. The Prophet says in the hadith here, these are the geographical stations for those who would like to do Hajj or Umrah. Liman marra alayhin. For, for the people of Yemen and these locations, and also those who pass through, they have to make their ihram as well from that location, inshallah ta'ala. Here's some technical things for you. Number one, check your flight route for a matching Miqat. Are you going to land in Jeddah? Are you landing in Medina? You need to check that. Are you going through Europe? Are you going through Asham, through Jordan, for example? Amman, Jordan. Are you coming from Yemen? Are you coming from, from Egypt? Check your route. Or are you going to Pakistan first and then coming from there? Or are you coming from Dubai? And then from Dubai you go to Jeddah, for example. Check exactly where your route is going to take you so you can determine on which Miqat is going to be the Miqat you need to make uh, uh, intention from. If you fly any of these maybe Middle, Middle, uh, uh, Middle Eastern airlines, most likely they will alert you at the time of the Miqat and when you're supposed to be making your intention. They will alert you. But if you're going with some of these European uh, airlines, I'm not sure they do that. But I know that the Middle, Middle, Middle Eastern actually airlines, they will remind you this is actually going to be going, coming to the boundaries very soon. Prepare yourself. So it's always better for you 
if you're flying straight from here all the way to Jeddah, to have your ihram ready so that when you are actually landing somewhere in Europe for transit, have it with you and you go and change in the bathroom there at the airport and when you come on the plane, you have your ihram on already. That's the, that's the best scenario. If it's not gonna stop anywhere, you can actually wear it before you go on the plane or you can change actually in the, on the plane itself, inshallah ta'ala. It's easy, no big deal. Some people feel embarrassed a little bit, but trust me, you will see a lot of these people all over the world during Hajj season wearing ihram and jumping on these different planes. Also, make sure that you prepare yourself before that. So before you leave home, make sure that you uh, uh, trim your, your, your mustache, uh, shave uh, the, the underarms, the pubic area for both men and women, obviously. Make sure to trim your uh, uh, fingernails. Groom yourself well. Make yourself ready for it, inshallah ta'ala, with the shower. And then when you're ready, you put your ihram on and you start your journey. Um, put your ihram towel on and then don't pronounce the, the intention yet. Let's say you land in Medina, for example. Prepare yourself in the hotel. Put your clothes on, but just don't make the intention yet. Wait until they take you to the Hulayfa, and then once you go to the Hulayfa, they will tell you, okay, if you would like to pray to Raqqa and make your intention, come back to the bus, or simply say, you know what, we're gonna be moving straight from there, just make your intention, and they go to the highway, and that's when you say, labbayk Allahumma hajj, or labbayk Allahumma umrah, whatever that you're gonna be pronouncing for yourself. And if you're doing it for somebody else, you say, Allahumma labbayk Allahumma hajj an fulan, which means, oh Allah, I'm making this hajj on behalf of X, Y, Z if you're doing it for somebody else. But before doing it for anybody else, this is gonna be actually supposed to be, to be your second hajj. Meaning your first hajj always go to you. Always go to you. If you're gonna do so, hajj for somebody else and you haven't done it for yourself, even if you pronounce their name, that hajj will count for you, not for them. So keep that in mind. And then you start with the talbiyah. Once you say, labbaik Allahumma hajj, the best act of worship you start with is لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ Non-stop all the way until you're done. That would be the best ibadah that you have. It's better than reading Quran, better than making dua, better than anything else. Why? Because this particular ibadah at Talbiya is exclusive to this moment and this time. Even if you do it outside of your ihram, it doesn't count the same. So therefore, engage in Talbiya as much as you can. For women, special instruction for women here, you wear your normal clothes. Does it have to be white? Not necessarily. Green? No. Whatever color that you wear, it should be, should, there's nothing actually, no restrictions on it. Also removing the facial cover, unless you're wearing, of course, medical thing. Like, for example, you're wearing mask because of medical issue. But for women, they should actually remove their niqab, they wear a niqab. Also for the women on their menses, they still, they still need to make their intention for ihram. But when they come to Mecca, they're not gonna make tawaf yet. So you need also to make your ihram intention even though you're still in your period, before you pass the, the, the miqat area. But when you go to Mecca, you're not gonna go to the haram yet until you're free, inshallah, from your period, and then you can make your tawaf and, and say and so on. Some restrictions when it comes to the, to the ihram. Number one, for men, wearing what we call al-makhit. There's a big misunderstanding what makhit is. Many people, they, word, they translate the word makhit for mistranslation for stitches or the seams basically that you see on your, on your sleeve, for example. This is called makhit. But the actual meaning of makhit means the, uh, the cloth that actually wraps your limbs. So this is now, is makhit. Even though there are stitches here, if I take this off and wrap it around my waist, wrapping it around my waist as a loin cloth or as a lungi, it works as actually as, a, as an ihram. Should be fine, even though it has stitches. Some people, they worry about their shoes. They say, well, I have a slippers, or I have actually sandals that has stitches on it. It doesn't matter the stitches. What matters is that's not it, the, 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 the slippers or the, for example, um, what do you call it? The sandal that you're wearing, even if you're wearing Crocs, for instance, it shouldn't wrap your foot all the way above your ankles. So it should be like sandals, and if it's below the ankles, it should be fine. It should be okay. What if it was made of leather? Fine. How about rubber? Don't do that in Mecca. Advice. Because rubber is going to get really hot in the summer and your feet is going to just simply going to cook you on it while you're wearing that thing. So avoid rubber stuff. Leather is good, foam is good, crocs good, as long as you have, of course, you know, something with a color that doesn't absorb the heat. Wearing, uh, cutting your, of course, fingernails and clipping your nails when you're in a state of ihram. 
wearing perfume instead of ihram, also not good. And uh, uh, if anyone does that, if anyone does that, then they become liable to pay something called hadi, or fidya actually, fidya. Al-fidya is a sacrificial animal, in this case, a lamb or a, or a goat, uh, because of the mistake that they have done and the error that they have done. For the, lay, for the men, again, also covering the head is, is not acceptable for them, but you can, of course, have a, um, an umbrella. Also, you could use your ihram clothes to do this. But how long are you going to keep holding it like this anymore? Anyway? But if you're going to do this, if it was done by mistake or temporary or just until you remembered, it's fine. But if someone deliberately because, oh, my God, it's too hot, man. Then in this case, go into the shade and find a way to stay away from the sun during that time, inshallah ta'ala. The ladies also covering their face, unless, of course, they become in a crowded place or a health issue, they, should, they can do that, inshallah ta'ala. So all of this will engage the person into, it makes the person actually engage in, have to pay the fidya. But if someone engages in sexual uh, intercourse, actual sexual intercourse, it would nullify their hajj for them. So that's a very serious business here. Anything less than intercourse requires fidya. But still the hajj can still be valid and be saved. But the actual intercourse invalidate their hajj for them. How to wear the ihram? So a simple demonstration here. I'm going to show it to you quickly, inshallah ta'ala. Because I know a lot of guys are just so concerned about their safety and their, يعني, their modesty and all that stuff. And take it easy, jama'a. يعني, it's, it's not that, that dangerous. Here we go. So simply, there are multiple ways of doing that. I'm going to use the easiest way for you. So you wrap your waist with that. Is already clear? Make sure that you open basically, uh, make your, your feet apart a little bit to give you uh, an easy way to walk. And then wrap it around. Hold from here. And then put it in. Tuck it in. And then wrap them around like this. And we're done. That's it. That's the easiest way. Now, if you're worried about this, keep slipping down, yani, in this case, maybe you can just use a, a belt underneath and you wrap it under, tuck it under the belt if you want to. There are multiple ways of doing it. If you have another way, bismillah. So try it out and do it for yourself. When you put that on, you put uh, the other piece on top. Now, how do you put the other piece? There's no specific actual format to do it. You just put it over your body and that's it. You have to clip it and put a, a safety, uh, for example, a pin or anything. No need for that. This is just enough. This is sufficient. And when you start your tawaf, that's when you uh, reveal your right shoulder. Only during tawaf. And if you reveal it, reveal it before or after, it's fine. Don't worry. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're just going to get uh, maybe a, a sunburns. So therefore, keep it covered until you do your tawaf. And then when you're done, inshallah ta'ala, you can cover that again and you'll be okay with Allah I'm going to leave these here, inshallah, for you to practice after, inshallah, we're done. Those who would like to try it out with Allah This is actually a standard size. So uh, that's what you're going to get. If you need uh, uh, yani a bigger size, that's on you. <clears throat> Bismillah. For those who would like to see the map of Mecca, Scan this quickly before I actually uh, open that page. Because I need to show you uh, the space, at least to visualize where you're going to be going, where you're coming from. So quickly here. So if you see it over here, this is now one of the most modern imaging of Mecca. All of this, as you see, is the construction, the addition and expansion of the Haram in Mecca. So this is Mecca, this is the Kaaba, Al-Haram al Mecca. If you have, if you heard about, or if you've seen in pictures probably maybe that the, the, the clock tower, the clock tower is right here. See the shade, the shadow? So it's right here. This is actually the, 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 uh, the big towers, and there are many, many different towers, different hotels in that same complex over here. Many of you probably heard, if, I don't know how many of you are going to be staying in Jabal Umar. Anyone got their hotels in Jabal Umar? No one got their hotel in Jabal Umar. So Jabal Umar is not the name of the hotel actually, it's the, the area, which is this one here. Multiple hotels. So there's the Hyatt and there's actually uh, 
five stars really, and four stars hotel. The convenience of this location is you're going to be basically five minutes walk from the Haram. If you have not taken your, uh, your hotel in that area, then most likely your hotel is going to be here in Al Aziziyah. This is Al Aziziyah over here, which is closer to Mina. As you can see, this is Mina right now. So let me zoom it out a little bit. So you see, this is Mecca right now. This is Al Aziziyah because you're close to Mina right now. But to get from Aziziyah to Mecca, although visually from here we say, oh, just it's a one highway, alhamdulillah, that's easy then. Yeah, good luck with that during the Hajj season. It will take you forever to get there. Yeah, outside of Mecca season, or the Haram, I mean the, the Hajj season, it's easy. A few minutes you'll be there. But during the Hajj season, it's going to be so crowded, it takes forever to get there. Walking, it's going to take you at least an hour and a half to two hours just to get there. So just to give you an idea. So I don't know which package you guys have you, you purchased from Mutawif. We don't know what the logistics are. But overall, it depends on what you paid for. This is what you get. So and just to give also to visualize the situation for you to make it clear. So this is now is actually um, Mina. This will be, if you see here, the Jamarat. So here's Jamarat over here. This is the camp of Mina. And usually, the American camps and the, the Europeans are actually in that area here, in that region. You guys have you've been privileged to be among the closest to the Jamarat, just to let you know. And here would be Arafah. This is Arafah. So Arafah, Mina, Muzdalifa, and all the way until you get you to Mecca, to the Haram here. Here's one interesting fact I want you to, to keep in mind. So to get yourself familiarized, inshallah ta'ala, with the, with the haram over here. If you look at this, so you are here, as you can recognize these two domes over here. That's al-Safa and that's al-Marwa. Al-Safa and al-Marwa. So you start here your tawaf, so you, I mean your sa'i, and you're always going to end your sa'i here. If your hotel in this area, obviously, you're going to have to take an extra run to come back again to a safa so you can get out from here to come closer for a shortcut to your tour hotels. Also, something to keep in mind so that you memorize this inshallah easily for you. I don't know if you can see it from here, but if you ever get a chance to see it, uh, whenever, they, whenever they built the haram back then, they made the minarets in pairs. So there are two minarets over here. They're constructing new two minarets right now. Two minarets are being built over here. And, oh, sorry. Here we go. And uh, um, two minutes everywhere when they're constructing, except for this one over here. This one is in one minaret. Why is that? Because that minaret indicates the corner of the, of the Hajar al Aswad and where the beginning of a Safa al Marwa as well, too. And it's also parallel, if you notice. to the direction of Mina and Arafah. It's from here. So if you are lost, I would suggest for you to always, when you go to the Haram in Mecca, the first thing you look for is that sole and single minaret. You locate that one, and with your mind orientation, recognize where you came in and where you're going to go out. So you recognize the, 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 the right direction for you, where your hotel is, and so on. That's the number one. Also, that was indicated with the green lights. There are green lights on that same corner, so that tells you that this is it. That sole minaret, also an indication that you are coming closer to Al Hajar Al Aswad. So when you make your tawaf, instead of keep looking where's Al Hajar Al Aswad, just look to your right. If you see the minaret, well, which is obviously going to be able to see it, you know that you're coming closer to the end of your circle and the new one. So you start counting as you come close there. Back then, they used to have a dark uh, marble line. It was brown, the marble line, all the way from Al Hajar, goes all the way down to that, to that actually, uh, that, in that direction. So people recognize that this is the place where you start your circle and you, you end one. But because of that line, people were pushing and shoving each other, it was, became very dangerous. So what they did, they removed it. So no one starts, you know, no one stops there, because people used to stop at the line and make their uh, takbir to the Hajar as well and slowing everybody else. So that's why they removed it completely, but now you can tell from that soul man. So remember that. That minaret is an indication to where Al Hajj al Aswad is, where you start your tawaf and you end your tawaf. Also, where you need to go for Safa, 
So you begin your side between Safa and Marwa, and even if you want to go out to Mina and go out to other places, it's in that direction as well too. <clears throat> Let's go back to the presentation, inshallah. <clears throat> Next, arriving at Mecca. So number one, you need to perform Umrah. This picture that you see over here, this is during COVID time. So I'm not really sure if they still have the same restrictions. And if you look at these restrictions, there is a circle around the Kaaba. That circle is not allowing anybody to come near, near Kaaba itself. Obviously, there's a reason for that. Why? Because during COVID, when people touch and kiss and so on, so everybody does the same thing. They're going to carry, of course, the germs and all the, the disease with them. So they did not allow anybody during that time to come near the Kaaba. Everybody makes their tawaf around, from around it. They only allowed in that area, actually, people on wheelchairs because they push them and just make circle faster for them, and that's it, they, they let them go. But no one was allowed to go and touch, actually, Al-Hajj al-Aswad during that time. Um, <clears throat> making sure that when you arrive, you perform your Umrah. You perform your Umrah. And we're gonna explain what the Umrah is, inshallah, ta'ala, in a few slides afterwards. And with the Umrah, you need Tahara and, uh, uh, when you make your Tawaf. So make sure to hold your Wudu yani, as long as you can. Because frankly, if you lose your Wudu and you're gonna have to go to the bathroom, it's gonna be a long journey. So make sure that you try your best. But that doesn't mean to go and uh, kill yourself with thirst, you're not drinking anything. No, just don't drink coffee, don't drink uh, uh, tea. Just make sure to go, inshallah ta'ala, to make your tawaf when you're, when, you're, when you're rested well. If you find a time to arrive at the hotel first and take a nap, go ahead, take a nap. Get some rest, even if you sleep an hour or two. And when you get up, you take another shower, or maybe make, make quick wudu, and get down to go and make your tawaf. Because it's better for you to do your umrah when you, alhamdulillah, you restore your energy than doing it when you're half dead. You're not gonna enjoy it. It's gonna be actually difficult. You might even get sick as a result of that. So please, when you arrive, if you feel that you're, you're, you're tired and you need time to rest, you do it, inshallah ta'ala first, and then you're gonna go start your umrah afterwards. Uh, women on their menses, obviously, they're not gonna be able to do their umrah. So when they arrive in Mecca, they simply just go to the hotel and wait until, inshallah ta'ala, their turn and it comes for the tawaf. When you see the Kaaba for the first time, it's highly recommended to make it a special moment. Really, because subhanAllah, it's very interesting. Like, by the way, when you drive, if you, if you ride buses, if you come with the, uh, with the train, it's different. The train in Masha of Medina to Mecca is very easy. Two and a half hours, you'll be there. But if you come with the buses, they're gonna take a while. So as you arrive towards the Haram, you realize that the first thing that you see, and that's the interesting thing, the first thing you see when you're driving actually towards, the, towards the Mecca and the, and the Haram, the first thing you see is the tip of the minaret and the tip of the, uh, of the, of the clock tower. It's on, on the level of your sight. But then as you start coming and ascend, descending down, suddenly, oh my God, it's way up there. It's so high. So literally, Mecca and the Kaaba is in a valley, as Allah described in the Quran, biwad in ghairi zara. It's a valley. And when the water comes down, it gets flooded, actually. The system, unfortunately, is not good there. Just to get flooded. So the idea, <clears throat> if you want to make it, make it special for yourself, the moment you put, you know, you have, you know, put your sight on the Kaaba, stop there, go to the left, go to the right, stay away from the traffic, of course, obviously, raise your hands and make your dua. Make your dua until you feel satisfied, and then you start making your tawaf, inshallah, tabarakah wa ta'ala. Now, once you finish your umrah, and the Umrah begins by looking at the, again at the soul minaret and start from behind that line where the, Kaaba, the Hajar Aswad is, the, the black stone. And then you make seven circles. When you're done, you would go to Al uh, uh, Maqam Ibrahim to pray to Raqqa. We're gonna explain that later, inshallah. And then until you're done. When you're done, you go to the hotel, you remove your ihram, and you're done with your Umrah right now. Then you go back to civilian for the next few days until the 8th of the Hijjah. However, if you arrive one day right before that, and you don't want to remove your ihram, you can still stay in the ihram, but your intention was supposed to be, at the very beginning, to do hajj only, not umrah. Now, again, I want you to familiarize yourself with the haram here. If you look at these now, uh, these minarets, there are always pairs of these minarets, as you can see, except for this one. That's the one that indicates that you are actually parallel to the Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone and you're near as safa or Marwa, safa specifically, and if you continue in that direction, it will take you to where Mina and Aziziyah is. 
Some of the things I want you to familiarize yourself with is the, uh, in the uh, what do you call them? Um, you know, these signs around the haram. Alhamdulillah, these instruction signs, they make things, makes it easy for people to know where to go. I mean, I remember doing Umrah and Hajj, subhanAllah, before there were no signs whatsoever. It was left for you to go and guess where to go from there. But Alhamdulillah, now everything is, mashallah, is digitized. Everything is being, mashallah, and it cannot done properly. And you can even, you can even now see these big screens where you have the QR codes where you can actually choose the language you want. And then it will give you a full instruction of Hajj, Umrah, Dua list, all that stuff and so on. Even if you scan this right now, it will take you to that page, but that page is from actually from last year. So there's still, this is not an updated picture, it's an old picture. But it could give you an indicator or at least an idea what you're gonna be seeing. So try to, to scan that, that actually QR code right now if you can. Scan it so that you can see what to predict in the next, inshallah, the version of it when they have it ready for you, bin Allah Azza wa An advice for you if you would go as couples, if you go as family, if you go uh, with a group of friends, they want to stay together, stick together. Always, no matter what, always uh, decide on a place to meet that you all can agree to. And don't say, meet me by these stairs. Good luck finding these stairs because you're going to get disoriented. But finding an actual spot, like for example, one of those big signs, and now Alhamdulillah, what they do, they make it easier for people. They have numbers. They have numbers in these entrance and these gates. So you can see around the haram, these numbers. Decide on the number. If you're carrying your phone with you, take a picture of it and tell each other, after we're done, meet me here. If you get lost, let's meet over here. And this kind of thing. So always have that kind of you know, way of getting to meet each other, inshallah ta'ala. How to do Umrah? How to do Umrah? <clears throat> so the way we do Umrah is the moment you arrive, inshallah, in the haram, like I said, you raise your hands, make your dua, and after you're done, you start your tawaf by putting your left hand towards the Kaaba, and you start, you keep walking until you get to the corner of Al Hajar Al Aswad. So, if I may use this as an example, so this will be the corner of Al Hajar Al Aswad. So, basic or it would be from this direction here, start from here. So, this will be Al Hajar Al Aswad corner, and in this case, this will be the southeast, and then Al Kaaba door is going to be on this side, and to the right side you will find uh, the Maqam Ibrahim. And Zamzam well used to be in that area, they removed it completely, they covered it as a matter of fact, so they can have easy for people to make tawaf. So, and that's when you, for, the, for the men to remove and reveal your right shoulder, and you start making your tawaf. You make your tawaf with dua and adkar, satish of the Quran, whatever you want. Can you do it silently? You can, but it's just a moment for you to connect. Where, where do I look? Because a lot of people, they look at the Kaaba as they're making their tawaf. You don't have to do that. You can look down, you can look to the front. Uh, the point is to make your adkar and your dua and f connect with your heart. So you make your tawaf. This area, you will feel the arch that represents uh, what they call it um, uh, Hijr Ismail. Hijr Ismail, part of it used to be part of the Kaaba. I'm not sure they're going to allow you to get in because back in then people used to get in and pray in that, in that area. And if you pray in that area, that means you prayed inside the Kaaba itself. But if you're not going to be able to do it, so they're going to be moving from around it. These two corners, they call them Ashami. Why? Because they're facing north towards Asham, like modern day Palestine. And then you continue in that direction. The other one will be actually Al Yamani, the Yemeni corner, which is basically going to be southwest. And from the Rukh al Yamani, you come back again to, us, to uh, 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 the Blackstone corner. That's when you, when you end one circle and you, start the, you begin with the second one. How do you begin the circle? You begin the circle by trying to kiss Al Hajj Al Aswad. If not, touch Al Hajj Al Aswad. If not, at least just to wave and say Allahu Akbar. You say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. If you kiss it and you just wave and say, not waving, basically kind of with your hand to point and say Allahu Akbar and then you continue. So from this side, I cannot reach it, it's too far. I will just say, Allahu Akbar, and just keep moving with your dua and your dhikr. Every time you finish one, you count one. Once you finish seven, then you're done. I know it sounds so easy to count seven circles. So easy to count seven circles. Please, save yourself the trouble. If you can get in your hand one of those counters or time or whatever that people they use sometimes for small beads, they put them around their finger, and you have seven beads. Just seven beads. So every time you make a circle, move one. 
And trust me, you're gonna even forget, forget moving one anyway. It gets so confusing because you get sometimes in that trance of tawaf that you don't even have, you know, you don't even feel it. And sometimes you just completely forget about it and you keep guessing, is it the five, fifth or the fourth one? The fifth or the fourth one? And you might be, be making tawaf 12 times probably without knowing that. So make sure to count right, inshallah. And if you start guessing and you miss uh, the count, then you always go with the lesser one. So if you say, is it the third or the fourth? The third or the fourth, they would say, you count as what? The third one. And you keep continue with the fourth one and afterwards and so on. Uh, you need to make wudu. So if you had to go use the bathroom while making tawaf, or you broke your wudu and tawaf, from the, mo from the place where you, where you stopped, you go out, you can make your wudu. Alhamdulillah, for those who like to make wudu, just water. There are stations there right now where you can make wudu. But if you can use the bathroom, you're going to have to go out. Once you're done, you come back again. You don't have to start from the beginning. From the beginning. You can resume from where you stop. If you couldn't tell where, then at least indicate, at least between which two corners. So once you have that, you start making to resume your tawaf from there. You don't have to start all over again. Are we clear on that? Let's say someone lost their wudu in the sixth uh, circle. I still have one and a half. When you come back, you go and you count the sixth circle and then the seventh circle. You don't have to start all over again, okay? Once you're done, you move towards the, uh, the maqam of Ibrahim and you pray to rak'ah. Now, you're supposed to pray behind it, somewhere behind it. But with the current situation and the construction and the number of people, there is no way you're going to be, be praying behind it. So what are you going to do? You're going to pray anywhere that it's allowed for you to, because they, they keep some space stations for people to pray the uh, uh, the, the So anywhere in the haram with the intention of Maqam Ibrahim, and you do it and you move on. Next, go to Zamzam. They used to have uh, specific stations for Zamzam. They removed most of them right now, so they have makeshift stations, or at least these canisters and these containers, you drink from them, and would make the dua, and when you're done, you start walking up in the same direction, all the way until you get to As-Safa. You get to As-Safa, you stand on As-Safa, you face the Kaaba, you make the dua, and then you start with your, uh, with your side between Safa and Marwa. The details of dua and what to be said can be found in the document that we shared with you, inshallah, wa ta'ala. So you make your circle from Safa all the way to Al-Marwa. That's one. Al-Marwa all the way back to Safa, that's two. Al-Safa back to Al-Marwa, that's three. So each one of them counts as one shout, as they call it. So you start from Al-Safa and you end at Al-Marwa. But once again, if, you, if your hotel is in that same direction, you're going to have to make that circle one more time. Because if you leave from the Haram to go around, it's going to be much longer than actually going from Al-Marwa all the way to As-Safa. When you're done doing that, you go and you shave your head or trim your hair. And for the women, they just kind of take from the tip of the hair, inshallah ta'ala, a little bit. And it should be fine. And with that, you exit, exit the state of Ihram and you go back to civilian life until the eighth day of the Hijjah. After Umrah, you go back to your normal activities. Pray in the Haram as much as you can. And if you can make Tawaf, Bismillah. So when you make tawaf, it's just like praying to rak'ah. Every time you want to make a full tawaf, you make seven times. You cannot just do, hey, I'm going to go to one, one circle, two circles. That doesn't count as a full tawaf. The full tawaf to count for you needs to be seven. So let's say I came a little bit late. So I prayed, I made maybe three circles, and then they call the iqama. You finish your iqama, continue your four to make them seven. Every time you finish seven, you pray to rak'ah behind the maqam. That's how you complete it. So I want to do another, just another round. Go ahead, a round of seven. Again, and two rak'ah after the maqam. After that, behind the maqam. So that's how you do the tawaf, inshallah ta'ala. Can, uh, um, can, can I make another umrah? Probably. Well, Umar bin Khattab an, used to forbid people from doing that just because he wants the people to keep making travels to come back to the haram. But if you know that this is most likely not going to be anytime soon to come back for, for the haram for me, you are allowed to make these umrah. So what do I do? You go outside of the boundaries of the haram, the sanctuary. So there's a place called At-Tan'im. At-Tan'im is outside the boundary of the haram, the sanctuary of Mecca. It's about actually, when there's no traffic, it's less than 15, 20 minutes maximum to get there. But with traffic, it takes forever. So therefore, you go there, wearing your malabis al-ihram, and you make the intention, just making the intention, and the same, the same actually uh, cab that you're riding, just turns around and come back again, bring it to Al-Haram. Back in, the, in December, it would cost us about actually 25 uh, real, that's all. 
wasn't that a big deal. But during Hajj, I don't know how much they charge. For the women, if while she's waiting in the hotel for these days, she becomes clear from her menses, then she can do her Umrah. In this case, she doesn't have to go actually to uh, uh, Tan'im because she's already still in the state of Ihram. She did not break her Ihram anyway. So that's why she can make her Umrah. When she's done, she can uh, uh, remove the Ihram state for her. Or if it's already Hajj time, once she's done with it, she just makes another intention for the Hajj and resumes with everybody else, inshallah ta'ala. Just to give you an idea, the boundaries of Al-Haram, what do they look like? So these now constructions are the new post to indicate the boundaries of Al-Haram. So when you see them, when you drive around and you see these, these actually big things, as it says, boundaries of the Haram of Mecca or the sanctuary. So the green, the green actually line that you see there, these are the boundaries of Al-Haram. What is so special about the boundaries of Al-Haram? There are specific rules for it. Uh, uh, the rules is that you're not allowed to hunt or actually or break any trees in that area. You're not allowed to do that. SubhanAllah, I mean, this is one of the early maybe, um, what do you call, conservation efforts in that, in that time. Because if everybody comes from, from out of Mecca, outside of Mecca and they want to hunt the animals in that area or cut the trees in that area, what happens? They will never grow any trees and they will, they will kill the ecosystem in that area. So therefore, the people need to go outside of the haram if they need to find food, or not food, food in terms of hunting. But are you allowed right now to uh, kill insects and so on? Yeah, of course, obviously. You are allowed to do that. Uh, some people, they think that, you know what, if there's a, a, a bug or even there's a mosquito, I'm not supposed to kill it because I'm on a haram. Kill it. Don't worry about it. So just go and wash your hands afterwards, of course. Yani. But the point is, make sure that you stay away from showing the animals that are there. What if the animal was harmful animal? We, we, we get rid of it. But any other animal, like pigeons or cats and so on, just let go of them. Don't, don't worry about them. If, any, if you have any question, just put it here, inshallah ta'ala, quickly before we move on to the next part of the Hajj. So we're done with our Umrah. Now we have maybe four or five days recreational time in Mecca until the days of Hajj begin. The eighth day of the Hijjah known as Yawm al This is the official, first official day of Hajj. Yawm al Why was it called Yawm al Because back in those days, people used to gather in Mina to fill their, uh, uh, um, we call skin bags with water, the containers with water, supplies, food, because they're gonna take a journey the next day to Arafah to stay for about a day and a half or two days. And Arafah was dead valley. There were, or did plain actually, there was absolutely nothing there. No water source and no food source. So people, they had to survive that journey. That's why it was called Yawm al But Alhamdulillah, nowadays, you can find water everywhere you go. There's nothing to worry about in terms of that. But still, it is part of the rituals of Al-Hajj. What did the Hujjaj do? If you were in the hotel, you need just to refresh, again, to cut the hair that needs to be removed or shave the hair that needs to be removed. And then after that, you put your ihram clothes, and then you make your intention by saying, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj, Ya Allah, I'm entering my ihram uh, for Hajj. And then, alhamdulillah, you come, you, you back again into the same state, state of ihram. What was restricted for you before becomes, when you did your umrah, you're back into the same restrictions right now. You can't cut your hair or remove it. You cannot approach your spouse, all these kind of things. Uh, then you move from the hotel to Mina. You stay in the camp of Mina, the camp of Mina, until, um, until after Fajr the next day. So what do you do over there? You're going to be praying Dhuhr, two rak'ah, on time. Asr, two rak'ah, on time. Maghrib, three rak'ah, on time. Isha, two rak'ah, on time. And then Fajr, two rak'ah, on time. And then you move to the next phase. Why am I saying on time specifically? Because you don't combine them. You only shorten them. You shorten the four rakah to two rakah, Maghrib stays three and Fajr stays two. And you should pray them on time. Now, do I pray Nafil and Sunnah? Well, there's no need for you to pray Sunnah. But if you want to pray Tahajjud at night, it's up to you. It's better for you to, to, to gain your energy, inshallah, so you can move on to the next level, bidnillah azza wa jal. Engage in dhikr and your ta'a and supply yourself with, with the food and whatever you need to, to carry with you to Arafah the next day, inshallah ta'ala. Just to give an idea how it looks like, so this is now the, uh, the, the tent of Mina, or the city of Mina. 
Usually, it used to be actually temporary tents. Right now, they're building some uh, brick and mortar, actually, facilities. So they're changing the system right now a little bit. So we haven't seen it yet because no one actually experienced that hajj with these new facilities, which explains why the prices went up, by the way. Because they want to collect the money that they spend on it from you. So uh, uh, that's just how it used to look like. And now, just to show an idea from the, tent that, from the map that we sh I showed you before. So if you look at this, these are the tents of Mina, and it extends all the way in. And here are the Jamarat. Here are the Jamarat. Our tents, or at least in what it's supposed to be the, for Europe and for America, the red, the red uh, color uh, uh, identifies the, 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 uh, the camps for the Europeans and for the Americans. Very convenient. The closest actually to, uh, to, the, to the Jamarat. Uh, so that's, is it going to be the same today? Allahu alam. Are they going to change the system with that? We don't know yet. So that's going to something you're going to have to discover on your own. Something to keep in mind. Always, always, always remember your tent number. Remember the tent number, write it down somewhere, take a picture of it on your phone, whatever that is. Because when you get lost, you're going to need to know how to get back there. So you need to ask these scouts to help you with that, inshallah, wa ta'ala. Restrooms, usually busy. So therefore, make sure, you need to make sure that you, uh, um, you make sure that you, know, you reduce your consumption of caffeine if you're worried about going to the bathroom more frequently. Although they said, alhamdulillah, they have actually improved the, the circumstances right now in Mina. We're going to see this this year, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, avoid any food that will upset your stomach, really, in that place. And it's easy, especially with the heat right now. Any food that stays outside of the fridge for some time gets spoiled, so be careful. Uh, stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. Ice cream actually is very good. Really, because it gives you water, it gives you sugar, it gives you actually minerals, and it keeps you hydrated. Uh, um, although it's luxury for us to say, take ice cream as your mom, but you'll find it there, plenty of it, subhanAllah. And uh, remember that you're going to be coming back again. You are going to be back again to Mina for the 10th, 11th, 12th, and maybe the 13th as well too. Depends on how many days you stay afterwards, inshallah ta'ala. You see this picture over here? That's a picture of uh, uh, how people used to go Yani for the, for the, in the tents of Mina. This is for the massive number of people in one place. The Europeans have it better, by the way, just to let you know. You guys, the Americans have it better as well. Used to be. I don't know right now what it's going to look like. But there are people having, mashallah, VIP, yani kind of standards. If you pay extra money, you get that luxury. I don't know if you've ever, if you've seen the new development that's already on YouTube. So I have the video for you here to watch. This is now the new thing. If you pay extra money, you get this service in Mina. So these are now the brick and mortar, actually, mina camps, as you can see. MashaAllah, there's shade, but there's still sun and air circulation. Look at the rooms inside. Tabarakallah. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. USB chargers even for your phones. Air conditioned. Look at the bathrooms. Allahu Akbar. And the wudu area. So all these are fancy ones right now, as you can see, Taban. But, I don't know if that's going to be you or somebody else. If you pay that extra money, you're probably going to get that. If you haven't, you're going to go with the peasants. Okay? So, uh, it depends on what, what level did you pay for. Allah <laughs> Now, you spend Yawm al in Mina. You wake up for Fajr. It's already the ninth of the Hijjah. And the ninth of the Hijjah for us known as the day of what? Arafah. The day of Arafah is a virtuous day. The Prophet ﷺ, in terms of the rulings of Hajj, he says, Al Hajju Arafah. The essence of Hajj is the day of Arafah. If you catch it, you catch your Hajj. If you miss that day, it doesn't matter. If you come for 10 days after that, you're late, you're done. You can't count this as Hajj for you. So make sure that you don't mess up that day. Day of Arafah, you're required to stay there most of the day. Most of the day. Okay? Preferably the whole day until the sunset. If you come late, then don't come too late that you didn't spend much before the sunset. You need to spend most of the day there in Arafah to count for you. In terms of reward, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this hadith that there is no day 
of the year that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will free people from Jahannam like the day of Arafah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yubahi al-malaika. He's even showing the angels his mercy to the people, to mankind. Whether they're going to hajj or staying at home. So even if you're not going for hajj, you can still earn that reward inshallah in the first 10 days of the hajjah bi azza wa jal. Just to give you an idea, what you see here on the left side, this is the Mount of uh, uh, Rahma, which is known as Jabal Arafah, they call it. People think that in order for you to be on Arafah, you have to be on that spot. Not necessarily. No, you don't have to be in that spot. All right? However, um, Arafah is an open plain and has boundaries. If you see you know, the picture on the right side, these yellow signs, you're going to see a lot of them there. These yellow signs will tell you these are the boundaries of Arafah. So if you're going to go somewhere in Arafah to walk around, make sure don't get out of the boundaries for too long. So don't go out and stay there. You can go out, for example, because Masjid Namira, which is the one in Arafah, this one, Masjid Namira is the Masjid where the Prophet wasallam, when he arrived from Mizdali, from, from Mina, he arrived in, in, in Arafah in that area. Masjid Namira, the majority of its front side it's outside of the Haram, outside of Arafah boundaries. The back part of it is part of the Arafah boundaries. So uh, when we were students in Medina, we were, of course, you know, broke. We didn't have any tents to stay, to stay in. So what do we do? We come as early as possible, and we enter Masjid Namira, and we go all the way to the back. And we stay in Masjid Namira the entire day. Alhamdulillah, air-conditioned, mashallah, cool and nice and beautiful. And you have people giving you food here and there, mashallah, yeah, any kind of snacks. But it was a very nice time. When the sun goes down, then we leave. So if you want to, you don't have to go to the Masjid Namira, especially if you're going with family members. Please don't try it out. Because by the time you get there and you get lost to go back again to your tent and your camp, you lost your day. So and especially in the summer, it's going to be extremely hot. You're going to easily dehydrated. Maybe when you get a, a heat stroke, so you're going to get sick and whatever. So stay in your tent, inshallah, ta'ala, enjoy the day of Arafah where you are. <clears throat> so stay in your tent. Get busy with your ibadah and dhikr. Listen to the khutbah, because they're going to have a khutbah right at Dhuhr time. And when this happens, listen to it. They have, as far as I remember, actually, I know right now, Masha, they have services where you have radio channels where you can listen to it translated immediately. Or even probably maybe uh, transcribed with, in, with English language, whatever language you, you, want, you want to listen to and, and read. After they're done with the khutbah, the khatib will pray Dhuhr and Asr, two rak'ah and two rak'ah, shorten and combined. Okay? Now, if you're in your tent and you're very far away from Masjid Namira, do not pray behind the Imam listening to the speakers on your phone. Because the speakers of Masjid Namira are not going to reach your tent. Instead, you just listen to the khutbah, and then you guys who are in that tent, Pray your Dhuhr and Asr together on your own, as a jama'ah. Make your own jama'ah in that tent. That's it. And if you couldn't do it with them, then at least pray Dhuhr and Asr yourself. Shorten and combine. Then engage in ibadah all the way until the sun sets. Just to give you an idea what's going to happen here. So you see all the way to the far right, that is Arafah. And then there's an empty space, as you can see, between Arafah all the way to Muzdalifah. The yellow uh, circle is actually Muzdalifah. Muzdalifah is a little bit different and challenging, at least in the past. Now they told me, alhamdulillah, they improved the facilities. They've already actually started making any you know, facilities and bathrooms and so on. Because it was, a, it was not even a full day, it's barely, barely, you know, kind of half of a night for many of the people. So they did not really service that place very much. So there weren't many bathroom stalls or water, you know, for everybody. And there weren't any covering. So people just gonna sleep anywhere they find. Anywhere. Some people, they stay in their buses, actually, as a matter of fact. So if you're lucky to find a place to hide yourself from the weather, from the rain, from this and that, alhamdulillah. Otherwise, you'll be in the open. Now they told me, alhamdulillah, they have actually increased the number of bathroom areas and water and so on. So that's good to, to hear, alhamdulillah, to get to know about. Because you stay there all night. But once you arrive in Muzdalifah, make wudu and pray Maghrib and Isha. Combined, and Isha is shorter to two rak'ah. You pray your witr, and then go to sleep. What I want to sit down and read Quran, I want to do my tahajjud. The sunnah on Muzdalifah is to take rest. Assumingly that you've, you've worked so hard in Arafah. 
So therefore, you take rest during the night of Muzdalifah because you have a long day to go and a lot of activity the next day. And I really recommend for you to take a nap and sleep on the, day, on the night of Muzdalifah. Although I know it's going to be extremely hard sometimes to do that, but you better do this. Because once you wake up for Fajr, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to be uh, uh, close to an area called al Mash'ar al-Haram. So al Mash'ar al-Haram, al Mash'ar al-Haram is the masjid that is located in Muzdalifah itself. You don't have to pray there in that masjid. Just anywhere, with your group, with your, with your family, by yourself. Just pray Fajr, inshallah, on time. And before the sunrise, you can start marching and moving, bidnillahi azza wa jal, to, uh, towards Mina. I wanted to show you actually the site itself, but I think where, saw that, where, where the Muzdalifah is, right? So there's no need to go to the map anymore. Now, what happened? Oh. This one? Yeah. So once again, you sleep, you wake up for Fajr, you pray Fajr, inshallah ta'ala, and before sunrise, you move, into, you move towards, towards Mina. One historical fact I want you to know about that area, actually, so significant historically speaking. One major event happened in the Sira, in the history, in that location, somewhere between Muzdalifah and Mina. You know what that is? Anyone knows? Somewhere you're going to be witnessing that location as you pass by, between Muzdalifa and Mina. The inst huh? No, it was actually Hadith al Fil, the elephant, the Abyssinians. That's where the elephant actually could not move forward from there, from that location. No matter how much they tried to push it to move and just keeps staying there. And Allah sent the Ababil in that location. So just historically speaking. Yani. Now, is there any indication of that in terms of geography and so on? I don't think that there's anything to indicate that, but at least that's what actually people tell us about that location. Now, the 10th day of the Hijjah. Now that you wake up, you wake up on the, in the 10th day of the Hijjah. Known as Yawmul Nahar for the Hujjaj and for everybody else known as what? Eid al Adha. Now, for the Hujjaj, for the Hujjaj, you guys, you don't need to pray Salat al-Eid. I repeat, you do not need to pray Salat al-Eid. How come? I'm there in Mecca anyway. Yeah, you have other ibadat to, work, to worry about. So you do not have to pray Salat al-Eid, so don't worry about it. Instead, just do your ibadat and your ta'a. So what do I do? Four things needs to be done on that day. Four things needs to be done, at least the ulama, they say, before the sun sets. Number one, okay, wait a second, are we, are we there yet? Oh, it's not yet, actually, wait a second, just before that, quickly I wanted to mention these things actually, we said that you pray Fajr under Mash'ar al-Haram, and that's the, the picture of Mash'ar al-Haram, the masjid. Uh, some people, the elderly, sometimes the women, sometimes children, sometimes people with disabilities, they move after midnight, they move after midnight to Mina, they don't stay the whole night in Muzdalifa, by, by the way. So if you, if you alhamdulillah you're healthy and strong and so on, you, want to st you can stay, you should stay. Because that's the son of the Prophet Sallallahu And if you want to collect your uh, stones from that location, go ahead. If you don't want it, that's fine. You can get it from anywhere. And then we move on towards Mina. Four things you need to take care of. Number one, throwing seven stones at the, the major, the major jamarat, the major jamarat. So there are three of them actually, three stations. You do it on the, on the, 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 the major one called al aqabatul Kubra. And that's a picture of it actually as they have it today. If you see the second picture, the, below, the, the picture below, these are now actually the, the, um, the bridges and also the different levels where people can go and throw the jamarat inshallah without having to uh, push each other. Because before that, subhanAllah, it used to be a stampede and all of you hear about incidents and accidents happening there. Now they're making it, mashallah, very convenient and easy for people to go in one direction, coming back from the other direction. There is no people going against each other's traffic. Uh, also, you need to uh, offer your sacrifice, al-hadi. And if you already paid for the voucher, they will do it on your behalf. So don't worry about it. The third one is shave or trim your hair. You can do it in the hotel room. You can do it at the barber shop somewhere around, Mecca, around the haram. Or you can have anybody just do that for you. It's up to you. You want to make it easy for you. If you don't want to shave completely, just bring your trimmer from here, charge the battery very well, and then when you get there, just take care of it. And it should be done, inshallah ta'ala. Then you are required to do uh, tawaf and sa'i. 
This is now the major tawaf of Hajj. If you miss it, you're going to mess up everything. For the ladies who are in their period, they're not going to do tawaf and sa'i yet. Instead, they do everything else, except they wait until they become clear from their menses. If they become clear before they leave Mecca, then they do their tawaf right when they're clear. After they're done, alhamdulillah, they make the tawaf no matter what day it is. And maybe if they stayed 15 days, 5 days, 10 days afterwards, they do their tawaf then and then they leave. But if they were unable and they had to leave because their company is not going to wait for them, then in this case, according to Sheikh Hassan ibn Tamir, rahimahullah ta'ala, they make their tawaf as a necessity, even though they're still on their period. And then they leave with the group that they came, they came with. So they don't stay behind or delay everybody else. Uh, and then after you're done from that, you can go to your hotel if you have a hotel to go to. But most people, after they're done, they go back to Mina. So they go back to Mina to spend the next, the next uh, two, the two and a half nights and also uh, uh, the days after. So we have now the 11th and 12th day of the Hijjah. 11th and 12th day of the Hijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the name of Allah Azza wa Jal in numbered days. These are the 11th, 12th, and the 13th. He said subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ If you decide to do it in two days, it's good. وَمَنْ تَأَخَّرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ If you decide to do it with an extra day, that's good. So you can do it in two days and you're done, or you can add a third day, which is the 13th. And you, and, and you can, in this case, have an extra day to stay there, inshallah ta'ala. If you ever try to stay that extra day, you will see for yourself how the haram, or how the, 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 the city of Mina becomes completely empty and dead. Like I tried that one time, one of those hajj how to stay that extra day, and it was depressing. I, Allah, I tell you, it was really depressing. It, was, it became like a ghost town, literally. Like we were just few hundreds of hujjaj staying there just to do that extra day. Everybody else left. It was really depressing, subhanAllah. And so it's up to you. But there is definitely a virtue, inshallah, to add an, an extra day for yourself. Those are the name, those days we call them ayyam al-tashriq. The day of al-tashriq, in which uh, people supposed to be, uh, back then they were called al-tashriq. Why? Because when they used to slaughter their animals, because they didn't have fridges like we have today, for the meat not to go bad, what would they do? They cut it into slices, and then they throw salt on it, and they expose it to the sun, to the, from, to the east, al-sharq. And that is basically tashriq, like put it in the east where the sun starts coming at it and basically dry that meat to create, to make jerky. So that jerky meat is the one that they carry with them when they go home on their journeys, on the long journeys. What do people do in these days? The same thing. So you throw the three jamarat right now, the minor, the middle one, and the major one. You throw seven pebbles on each station. And each one you do is just Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The details of these adkar are mentioned in actually that uh, um, document we shared with you. Then when you're done, each seven on the first one, you go on the side, make dua, and then move to the next one, do the seven, and then make dua, and then do the third one, and then move on. And you come back again, inshallah ta'ala, to your tent. Now, during the day, during the day, you are allowed to go anywhere you want. You can go to Mecca and pray in the Haram if you want to. But what's important is that you sp spend the night in Mina, or most of the night. Some ulama, they say you have to be there before the middle of the night. Like if you go pray Isha, and then come back again before the middle of the night, and you spend the rest of the night until Fajr time, then you're good. So the important part here is that you do during the night, you spend the night in Mina, and then you do the Jamarat in the next day. It's preferably that you do it after Dhuhr time, if you can. But now because of the size of the, the crowd, the ulama, they say, look, there is no restriction on the time anymore. Because if you have to do it after door, people, they're going to kill each other. Imagine two million people coming to one single spot. They all have to throw seven pebbles at a time. It's going to be very hard and difficult for them to do that. So once you're done, inshallah, from your hajj, meaning the 12th day or the 13th day, after you throw your jamarat, your hajj is over. You go to your hotel, inshallah ta'ala. Or if you have to go to the airport, from there you go to the airport. And that would be actually ready for you to leave. However... Before you leave, you need to do actually what we call tawaf al-wada' if you can. It's not rukun, which means if you miss it, it doesn't actually break your hajj. But if you can, it's always preferable that you end your journey by visiting the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Mecca. 
So you go and you do your tawaf, inshallah. There is no need for sa'i here. Just doing tawaf. Seven circles, two rak'ah behind the maqam, and then you just leave to the airport or go straight to Medina, wherever you're going to be going, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. The last section, inshallah ta'ala, is an additional section just in case somebody needed to know about these issues. It's actually visiting Medina. It's a very short one, inshallah. Visiting Medina. The Medina, the house of the Prophet, sallallahu wa sallam, the Prophet, sallallahu wa said about it, qal, al Madina to haramun amin. He pointed one day when he was traveling, coming back to Medina, he pointed to Medina, he goes, innaha haramun amin. This is a safe sanctuary. He said, this is a safe sanctuary, which means keep it a safe sanctuary. That's what it means. Uh, and if you, if you see the boundary in that picture here, those are the boundaries right now of Medina. The boundaries of Medina in terms of the haram of Medina. And if you see inside that, that purple circle, there's, an, there's another circle, or different circles actually. These are roundabouts, or you could say belt lines, highways that surrounding the, the city of Rasulullah sallallahu where people travel from one place to the other one. And if you look at that picture, this over here, can you see the arrow? Can you guys see it there? Do you know what that is? That's the mountain of Uhud. This is Uhud over here. And this is the Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right in the spot over here. So let me show it to you, inshallah ta'ala. If you want to take a, a scan for yourself to start zooming in, inshallah, it's going to take you to the map of Medina. So you can zoom in at your convenience if you want to. Got it? All right, so here. So this is Medina right now. Al-Haram. Mazin Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over here. And if you look, this is now Uhud. This is the mountain of Uhud. And the Prophet as he was describing Medina, he said Medina, Haramun Amin, and it's a very safe place, especially between Al Harratain. Al Harra used to be something like this, which is basically lava lava uh, field, because there were some volcanoes in that area actually. So it was protected naturally, which is why when the people of Al Khandaq they had to come, they cannot come from the top, they cannot come from the south or from the north, so they had to come from the area actually where there would be the tightest place so that on the sides, there were the two lava fields, and it's only one straight that people can go through to Medina. That's where they built the trench. When you go there, inshallah, they're going to show it to you, bin Allah Azza wa Jal, as you travel there, inshallah. Here you can see Masjid Quba, where the Prophet ﷺ, when he first arrived. And usually, when people arrive to Medina, they arrive from the north, by the way, from the Uhud area. But the Prophet ﷺ, because he took a different route to uh, deceive the people who were chasing him, so he came from south, وسلم, and he came to Masjid Quba. First, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Just to give an idea on the map here. The Masjid of Rasulullah is one of the three masajid the Prophet said that you should, if you're going to take, undertake any journey to visit any masjid for ibadah, for the virtue of the masjid, only three masajid. No other masjid on earth has a virtue that's deserving from you to undertake a journey to it. Some people, they travel to different countries to visit one particular masjid because they think there's a virtue, because someone died there, or there's a, a saint, or this, or that. That's not true. Only these three masajid, you go to them, you undertake a journey for the worship and the ibadah. But if you're going to go to another place for tourism, that's a different story. Like, oh, it's a nice, beautiful masjid. I want to take pictures with it. That's fine. But don't believe that there's a specific virtue for this place, except for these three masajid. One of them is... Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one salah in Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam equivalent to a thousand salah somewhere else. This is the site of uh, uh, where you could see the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar. And as you can see, um, it's in the front of the masjid between the official qibla and the mihrab of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You, uh, in the past, it was open for the public. Anyone, anytime they want to come, they would come. Now, actually, they're t with COVID, they learned a few things. So they're going to create a system for that. That system, you have to register. I don't know what the logistic for this. Uh, you have to ask the group that you go with. There's some registration that required from you. So you can come at a certain time of the day or the night where you're allowed to go through to give salam to the Prophet ﷺ. So when you go, you just go there and stand before the, the grave of the Prophet and say, Assalamu alaikum, Rasulullah. And then just move on.
This is just the site of Jabal Uhud. Just wanted to show to you how big that is. To give you perspective, the Prophet ﷺ said, those who uh, um, they pray janaza and then they attend the janaza, they will get uh, uh, two qirat of reward. And the qirat is as big as the mountain of Uhud. So you get two qirat, you're taking two actually size of Jabal Uhud in terms of reward for attending the janaza and also uh, uh, participating in the burial. Al Baqi' is a cemetery of Medina. If you get a chance to visit, go visit, inshallah ta'ala. I know some people they call it Jannatul Baqi' That's not Jannatul Baqi' Jama'ah. Hypocrites are also buried over there. Abdullah bin Bayez Salul is there. It's just a cemetery of Medina. Yes, there are Sahaba there, Aisha radiallahu anha there as well too, and other people are there. But people they call it Jannatul Baqi' Assuming that this is going to be actually, and if you're buried there, mashallah, then you're uh, in Jannah. Not necessarily. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who will be having a, a, a righteous end, Ya Rabbil Alameen. There's no doubt there's a virtue in being buried in Medina. There's no doubt about it. But again, al Baqi' is not Jannah. It's just a cemetery of Medina. If you would like to enjoy a special tour or an independent tour from your group in Medina, inshallah ta'ala, I highly recommend for you to check for this company. That company is actually is, uh, you're going to see their signs all over the, the city of Medina. About 16 different stations. And you pay, I think when we went to Umrah in, in December, it was $85, uh, 85 riyals, I'm sorry. 85 riyals for 24 hours. And it's hop on, hop off. So you just go to these 16 stations. These stations take you around Medina. They go to, to Uhud, they go to Qiblatain, they do Quba, they go to uh, uh, all these different sites that you need to visit. And you can do it on your own. The good thing about it, it's very well, uh, actually, digital guided uh, tour, which means you can, you can take from them earphones and plug it into the, the uh, next to your seat, and you choose one of maybe eight different languages. So you choose that language and listen to them as they approach these different stations, they will tell you what that is for. This is Uhud, this is this, this is that. And it goes every 30 minutes. So you can hop off, spend 30 minutes in that area, and you come back again to the station, another bus will come and take you there. And you keep, you know, going until you can spend the whole day, you can do whatever you want. So if you want to do it on your own, it's a nice, actually, fun ride, alhamdulillah. Very convenient. We try that for the Umrah. I don't know about the Hajj. And it's, you can find these stations very close to the Haram Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can find them in different places. So once you find that station, you can stop there and wait. And you can buy your ticket and go on to it, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make your journey successful and blissful, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and bring you back safe home, Ya Allah. Wallahu ta'ala. Any question, Jama'ah? Unless you guys have already over there. Because I know some of you might have asked questions or we already answered. In Medina, some people fast. Is that recommended? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الصِّيَامِ لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ الصِّيَامُ فِي السَّفَرِ It's not recommended for you to fast while traveling. And especially if you're going to be going to Hajj, really. You need your energy. You need your energy completely for Hajj. So therefore, if fasting in Medina, you find it convenient because, mashallah, I mean, these are virtuous days. I mean, these are Dhul Hijjah. I want to fast there. It's convenient. I'm in the hotel. You can do that. Oh, they, do, they fast in Medina out of love for the Prophet ﷺ? So you can't have that love unless you, you fast in Medina, yani? That's, it sounds wrong, yani, in that, in that sense. Allahu I mean, I appreciate the love for Rasulullah ﷺ, but fasting anywhere you go, have the same reward, inshallah, wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, question is about hijab. Do non-hijabi just wear regular hijab in the hajj, or they wear special clothes only for hajj? No, I mean, they're supposed to be wearing hijab all the time. But whatever that you, that you wear hijab, it's the same thing as, as a full hijab, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the ability to continue with the Ya Am I going for hajj this year? Unfortunately, I was not selected. So, not going. Uh, can we share the PowerPoint? Inshallah, we can do that. Uh, a journey of submission, halal provision. Can someone... I'm coming to you, inshallah. Can you elaborate on that one? Like I said, you know, making sure that if you want to go for Hajj, try your best to make your provision that you carry with you coming from Halal. Like pay for Hajj from Halal income. That's the meaning of it. Uh, what if my income was not 100% Halal? May Allah forgive you. 
with the Hajj be accepted? Now acceptance that between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of validity, the Hajj is valid. In terms of validity, if you go there and you do it, the Hajj is still valid. Acceptance that's between you and your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept from you, Rabbil Alameen. Wallahu alam. Yes. Uh-huh. So if you arrive with Ihram, wearing your Ihram to Jeddah airport, before you go to Mecca for the Umrah, are you allowed to stop by the hotel to take shower and then go to, to make the, the, the Umrah? The answer is yes, you are allowed to do that. Although some of the ulama, they say, better not to. But I'm going to be sweaty and smelly and... Well, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Azza wa subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he shows off to the angels, the ibad who came for ibadah, he goes, look, atawni shu'than ghubra. They came to me disheveled, dusty, sweaty. So that's maybe one of the, again, the, the times where it's considered more preferable to be in this condition as you meet your Lord showing your effort into making this ibadah correct, inshallah. But if you take shower, you're fine. If you're doing your hajj for somebody else, just mention their name. Say, Ya Allah, this is hajj for fulan. And it should be good, inshallah. Now. Um, is unscented uh, uh, um, tinted moisturizers permi permis permissible instead of ihram? Yes, you can do that, inshallah, tabarakah wa ta'ala. Moisturizers unscented should be fine. So if, you're, if your first stop is Mecca and you'll be performing Umrah first, since we will make the intention and physically get into the state of Ihram on the plane, what guidance can you provide uh, doing wudu in order to pray the Nafil Salah? Air per bathrooms, water flow is quite slow. Well, if you can make wudu, alhamdulillah, you don't have to make a shower there in the bathroom of the airport yani, or the, the plane. But make a quick wudu, one, just a little bit of in your hand and rub your body with it, your, your hand with it, should be fine. Uh, yeah, in Hadith Jabir radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu wudu, he used to make wudu from a handful of water. Like a cut, like basically a small bottle like this. He makes a full wudu. But when you have less water, you rub a little bit more to make sure that you have the water reaching every part of your body, inshallah wa ta'ala. If not, and you couldn't have enough a access to water while on the plane, just make tayammum so you can pray your two rakah, inshallah ta'ala. Due to COVID, I've heard that there isn't even an opportunity to touch the Kaaba. Uh, are we supposed to do so? You don't, you're not supposed to kiss your hand when you point to the Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone. Just simply look at, the, just point at the Hajar and say, Allahu Akbar, that's all. So is it the cooler are like not to be 100% Zamzam? Is there a place you recommend to find more pure source of Zamzam? I don't know anywhere actually else, Allahu Alam. I'm not saying that actually the, the, the haram in Mecca will have, uh, we're not going to have 100% zamzam, but in Medina most likely. Now, when you perform hajj al tamattu, that's basically when you do umrah first and then you have a few days and then you do hajj. When you do hajj al tamattu, do you trim your hair uh, in umrah before hajj? The answer is yes. Can you shave? You can shave if you have a few days. And then by the time you go to Hajj, they still, you don't have enough hair growing you know, on your head. And when you're done, what do you do? You still need to shave if there's anything yani, kinda coming out. Otherwise, if there is no hair, there is an exempt. You don't have to shave anything. Yani. Do we must need to write a will? If so, what do we must need to cover? You, it's not an obligation, but it's highly recommended that you do your will before you leave anywhere, really, because you don't know what happens to you. Uh, and what do you cover in that well? The most important thing is after encouraging people to, of course, to observe their ibadah, their taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask them to make sure to fulfill the financial obligation that you owe other people. Also include um, uh, the inheritance. If you can make, to make sure that whatever inheritance that uh, you leave, you leave it and they need to be divided according to Islamic law so that people understand how to do it right, inshallah wa ta'ala. May Allah accept from you, Rabbil Alameen. Is there any significance of praying nafil at Maqam Ibrahim? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُ مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take a, a, a place of a prayer behind the Maqam Ibrahim, the Sitch of Ibrahim. So Allah's command, so we submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's more like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us recognize Ibrahim in every aspect of our ibadah. Because he was the one who showed us the meaning of submission. So we follow his example. 
During the ihram, if men have uh, an issue with the urinal residual after washing up, what is the ruling on, on this? If they, if, if they cannot control it and they keep, it keeps leaking basically in this situation, they are allowed to uh, maybe wear their, actually their under, underwear in this regard. And because now they need to protect their, uh, themselves and their ihram from najasa regularly. And in this case, if they have to wear even adult actually diaper to protect themselves, and they're closed from the najasa, they should do that, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them, I mean, give them shifa. So what is the first thing I need to do to start hajj? I think we, we, we explained that already, yani. This is the first thing is, of course, your intention, and then when you go, you put your ihram on, you do your umrah, and then you do, inshallah, the, 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 the rest of it can be found in the presentation, inshallah, azawajal. You can watch it online. If one cannot walk barefoot during tawaf and sa'i due to sensitive foot, what is the ruling? You can put your shoes on. As a matter of fact, a lot of people put their shoes on and it's okay. As long as your shoes is clean, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Can we do umrahs for the family members, especially those who are not alive? You can, however, it's better for you to do it for yourself. And inshallah, you get the reward and they get the reward for your intention. And if you're going to do Hajj Badr, which means on behalf of somebody else, just the intention. When you do the intention, you mention the name and it should be fine, inshallah. Due to the heat, is it better to have multiple ihrams? I mean, it's up to you at your convenience. That's luxury. People, they barely have one. Now, nah. Yes, sister, you had a question, right? Yeah, the Umrah you do, if you want to do Umrah on behalf of somebody else, someone who is um, physically incapable of going for Umrah themselves, or someone passed away. But just because they don't have the money for it yet, no, you don't do Umrah for them. No, Wallahu alam. You can, you can do that if you have a time to do multiple Umrahs, obviously. But the, mo the first one should be for you, inshallah. No. Can one shower in the period of ihram? Yes, you can. Any local shops that sell ihram here uh, in the U.S.? Hmm. I don't know. If you know anything. I think if you look at Amazon, you're going to find it as well too, right? Everybody. So locally here in Dallas, if you look, go to Richardson, they have a couple of stores. Plano, they have another store as well too, I know for sure that they have actually there. Go to ICI as well too, probably maybe have it, inshallah ta'ala. Nah. Jazakallah khair, yes. Like for example, if you scratch and a and, and couple of hairs, for example, fall off, does that break your ihram? No, keep scratching as you wish. It doesn't. What's, 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 what meant of that hukum is intentional shaving or cutting the hair. That's what actually breaks the ihram. Similarly, if someone, you know, subconsciously they're biting their nails and they cut their fingernails, that's okay. That doesn't count as something deliberate, yani. unless, of course, you're deliberately doing it. So now, if it was subconscious, it should be fine, inshallah ta'ala. If you went to a bathroom in a restaurant or a hotel, whatever, and then you went and washed your hands and they had scented, let's say, uh, soap, that's okay. It's not a big deal. But not deliberately to wear perfume during the state of ihram. Naam, Allah Alam. In the well, if there is a number of uh, dollars left for upbringing your minor children until college, what is the rule uh, of zakah on that? Well, if you already have established, if you already have established the, the what do you call, the, 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 the uh, education fund for your children, uh, then uh, uh, that's one thing. But if you haven't established it yet and you want to put in your will, if I die, please put this much money for them in an educational uh, uh, account, you can't do this anymore. Because once you die, the money is no longer yours. It's over. 
So if you want to leave them something for college, you need to start that account today or sometimes before you, you, you leave. So that becomes that. And if there's money that accumulated in there, alhamdulillah, as part of the investment, if there is a zakah, that's a whole different game on how to pay zakah for that. We talk about it. We have a whole presentation on zakah. You can watch it online, inshallah ta'ala. Is two required to put on your ihram? No, it's not required. It's not part of the ihram. It's just recommending if you have access to do that, inshallah, uh, ability to do that. To confirm, is it permissible to wear perfume after taking the shower before boarding on the plane, but not after deciding that intention? Correct. You can put perfume as much as you want before you pronounce your, uh, your intention. Once you pronounce your intention, khalas. You can't do that. You can't put wear, wear, uh, uh, perfume until you're done. Blackstone, doesn't matter which hand you raise uh, by, while passing by. It should be the right one, obviously, the son of the Prophet ﷺ. If you can, obviously. Uh, to keep track of the number of tawaf, uh, can you use a marker to draw a line on your hand if you don't have uh, a counter? Is that feasible? In your... <laughs> I haven't done that. I haven't seen anybody doing this. I always tell my kids, don't draw your hands. <laughs> so if you want to do this at your own risk, it's up to you. But I don't, I don't think it's haram yani, to do that. But I would say, I don't know if it's not uh, yani, an interesting thing to do. Now, yes, go ahead. A woman, her men says she doesn't have to pay sacrifice for not being able to do the specific ibadat. No, she doesn't have to pay anything uh, as a compensation. What else can she do if she's not going to be able to make tawaf and so on? You can simply, inshallah, engage in dua, adhkar, uh, maybe reading tafsir, um, contemplating, you know, serving the people around you probably would, would take reward for helping them out, inshallah, to barakah wa ta'ala. There is so much you could do. The adhkar and dua is open, inshallah, azawajal. Wallahu a'lam. Um, if you faint during tawaf and taken out uh, aside for medical treatment and then this turns into an extended uh, time frame, one or two hours, what do you do? If you, if you go out for that long, you come back, you start over. Because now there's something called muwala, which means the continuity of the tawaf it was broken because of that. What is the significance of doing extra tawaf? What is the reward for this? Can you do extra tawaf for someone else's behalf? When the Prophet committed Umrah, extra tawaf is for you. Because the extra tawaf is just like you praying two rak'ah. You can't pray two rak'ah for somebody on behalf of somebody else. So that extra tawaf you do is because this is the only place you can practice this ibadah. You can't do this in Medina, you can do this in, in Dallas, you can do this anywhere in the world. It's the only place you can practice this ibadah, so do as many tawafs as you can. Because once you leave Mecca, خلاص, you, don't pray tawaf, you don't do tawaf anymore. Uh, we said that the female is on her period, she waits to do her tawaf or umrah, but does she still do sa'i? It's, it's actually a, an arguable and disputable thing. Some ulama, they say, because a sa'i wal marwa, a safa wal marwa, outside of the haram of the masjid. So therefore you could do that. But some, they say, no, well, that was before they built it inside the masjid right now. Because right now a safa wal marwa connected to the masjid itself. So therefore they shouldn't be in there. So they wait until they're, they're free from their period, inshallah ta'ala. So if the female's prayer does not end and she does tawaf and sa'if of had, does she need to pay a penalty? No, she doesn't. Because she did that out of necessity right now. She had to do it in the last day before they left. If so, mutawaf covered uh, could be had. So now how to give the umrah sacrifice? Sacrifice needs to be after umrah or after hajj. It doesn't really matter. It, well, it's supposed to be actually done after hajj, yani when you're done. But I, I, as far as I know, Allahu Alam, I'm not sure about the details, that they, because of the number of uh, animals that they have to slaughter on, on, the, on the Hajj, on these Ayam al Tashriq, they don't even have enough uh, um, butchers to do that. You're talking about thousands, if not even millions, actually, of animals done in these four days. 
So that's why I heard that some, they, they were given a fatwa to start the slaughter actually from the beginning of Hajj time. Otherwise, if they're going to wait until that, it's going to take more than it should be. Uh, but wallahu alam, I think actually the right thing is to do it after Hajj begins. And if it extends, if it extends beyond that, then it's better inshallah ta'ala for them. It should be okay. Did you say we exit the state of Ihram on day 10 after stoning, sacrificing an animal and shaving and trimming the hair? Men will be making tawaf of Hajj in their regular clothes. Yes, you can do that. Usually, actually, you remove your clothes and put your clothes on if you do three out of the four. If you do three out of the four, then you can take off your, your clothes, or your ihram, put your normal clothes and go and do tawaf with your normal clothes. It should be fine, inshallah, with that. So, uh, for the farewell tawaf, during our stay in Mecca, some days, nights, if we go to Jeddah, do we need to farewell or only one time tawaf when leaving finally to Mecca? It's supposed to be whenever you leave Mecca that you do that. But if it's going to be inconvenient, again, tawaf al wada is not rukun. So if you miss it, you'll be fine. But I highly recommend that you do it. So if you couldn't do it every time you leave, then just one time when you have the final departure from Mecca, inshallah ta'ala, that's when you make your tawaf al wada Yes? Uh -huh. Same thing. But again, it's not obligatory. No. So what's the logistic behind a female having her hair cut to leave the state of Ihram if we cannot exit the state by, by cutting our hair and our own hair and we're in hotel rooms with females only who cuts the hair for the first female to leave the state of Ihram? Actually, you can cut your hair. It's okay, you can cut your own hair. For the guys, just bring your trimmer, just like shave yourself, it's okay. Like once you're done with your umrah and you are allowed now to cut for yourself, then go ahead, you can do that inshallah. So women, it's not like I have to have somebody do it for me. No, if you do three out of the four, you're done. Yeah, even females, they can grab their hair, just cut the trim, trim it from, from, uh, from the tips. Yes. After the first jamra, yes. The jamarat. So on the 10th, you only do the, the major one. On the 11th and the 12th, you do the three of them. No, 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 no. You're the haram, you're done. You're haram, you're done. Unless, unless you haven't done three out of the four. Let's say somebody didn't do the three out of the four on the first day. And they only barely just did, let's say, they did their jamara on the first day. They haven't cut their hair, they haven't slaughtered the animal, they haven't done their tawaf. They stay in ihram until they do three out of the four. No, don't wait for them to tell you that they've done your, your uh, sacrifice. Assume that it's done. Assume that it's done on time for you. And you should be fine, inshallah ta'ala. Do what? Yeah, you can shower. If you're on Mina, you can shower. It's okay. There's no need, right? You can shower any time you want after that because you're, you're done with your haram. Now. Oh, and during those five days, you can. You can shower as you wish. But again, it's better not to. As the Prophet said, Allah subhanahu wa would love to see you actually in your tafath, as Allah named it in the Quran, which means your sweat and so on, as a sign of devotion and dedication. Yani. It's just for those days, that's all. The name of the tool company, I honestly forgot the name of the tool company, but if you look it up there, inshallah, that's uh, red buses, just like the, the, the British actually, the double deck with open, uh, the open on the top. I did Hajj when I was in college with my parents. Is that considered my required Hajj? Yes, it, it was. If you're adults, obviously it's in your college. It did count as your official Hajj, inshallah. I hope, you, I hope you've done it right, yani. Naam. You don't need to do another hajj yani after that, you're fine. If you have doing hajj badal, yes, you need to mention their name. How does who wear niqab uh, do that in, uh, for the ihram? They should not actually cover their face. Uh, 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 usually the ulama, they say, unless of course they, they're close to area where men are, they can throw something over their face to cover, 
like to their, their uh, niqab, but then when they go, they just re, uh, uh, reveal their face again. No. The mask, yeah, it was actually an obligation when you go there because during Umrah they had to, they had, you have to put masks. For medical reason, you should actually cover that. But I don't know if they if they required right now uh, in the Hajj season. Allahu alam. Can we collect the 21 stones from uh, uh, from the stone in the Shaitan area, which is the Jamarat area? Yeah, but don't don't do it uh, right where the the post is. Go farther out and collect it from somewhere else and then come back again to do it, inshallah ta'ala. And you don't have to wash them or put perfume on them. You don't have to collect them from Muzdalifa because I know in some traditions they have to collect from Muzdalifa. You have to wash them, put some perfume on it and say, mashallah, and then start doing that. You don't have to do all that stuff. Now. Oh, you collect more? Oh, you put a hundred in your pocket. Trust me, you're going to get confused even. Because sometimes as you try, someone pushes you, you drop it. Oh my God, where did it go? Which one of them? I don't know. Just get, grab one and just do it. You should be fine, inshallah. Do I know any scholars going for Hajj from the U.S.? Um, I honestly don't know. I know some people were accepted, but their, their uh, case was pending. So I don't know if it went through or not. Yani. But alhamdulillah, just to give you good news, inshallah ta'ala, Al-Maghrib Institute actually is, inshallah, is going to create a 24-7 uh, hotline for the hujjaj. So when you're there, feel free to contact that line if you have any question. Inshallah, hopefully we can answer your question, bin'Allah Azza wa Jal. Also, uh, there's an idea that's circulating, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully, our uh, uh, U.S. scholars will be available to create, inshallah, a live platform online for the hujjaj. So while you're in Mina, while you're in Arafah, inshallah, you can just log into that platform and listen to their khatras and their talks live, inshallah, and ask your questions. So hopefully that at least substitute for the loss of their physical presence over there. Yani. Wallahu alam. Can, uh, can you show us the length of uh, the hair for a female to cut? Actually, it doesn't matter, anything. Just the better tip of your fingers. That's, that's more than enough. So we're staying 14 days outside of Hajj. Do we shorten our prayers or pray full? If praying behind an Imam, you need to, if you pray behind the Imam, you need to pray full. But if you pray by yourself or behind an Imam who's traveling, you pray short, inshallah, it should be fine. Is there a video for wearing a mask? For the health wise, no, you're good. Our Rabbi on the third, inshallah ta'ala, to do Umrah, Hajj Tamattu, and stay in Mecca until Hajj start. Meanwhile, can I do extra Umrah while waiting for Hajj? Yes, you can. Yes, you can cut or shave or even trim your husband's uh, hair, inshallah ta'ala, after Umrah when he, or Hajj when he's done. Toothpaste that has a taste, it's fine. Doesn't actually break the ihram. Do men wear the ihram towels during the Hajj tawaf? Well, it depends. Like I said, if they've done three out of the four, they can be wearing their civilian clothes when they make their tawaf. But if they haven't done it, then they need still have their ihram until they've done the three out of the four. If a woman did it uh, uh, when, on her period because she could not wait any longer, does that count as a hajj for her? Does she have to do it again? It counts as a full hajj for her, and she can be fine, inshallah ta'ala. Can we take pictures there in Mecca and Haram? Yeah, you can, but focus on your ibadah. Can we cover face, our face when we are sleeping for the sisters? Um, I'm assuming you mean blankets, obviously. If you do that, that's natural and it happens usually. Hajj, kids taking, uh, going for Hajj. If uh, parents are having enough money to send their kids for Hajj, is that kid Hajj considered fard or kids has to do Hajj with their own money? I'm assuming you're talking about young kids. If young kids, you know, it doesn't count as Hajj for them until they, well, the obligatory Hajj. It does count as Hajj for them, but not the obligatory one until they reach the age of puberty. But if you talk about your adult kids and you're paying for their Hajj, it counts as their Hajj, even though it's not their money. Do we need to hit the Jamarat or it gets in the basin uh, uh, is good? Yeah, it does, you don't have to hit the whole thing. As long as it, get, it falls into the whole pool, it should be okay. What is the reward for Umrah? If you go for Umrah only, you shouldn't be going for Umrah only if you're going during the Hajj season. Leave the space for the Hajjaj. But if you're going any other time of the year, 
The Prophet says, Al Umrah ila Al Umrah, Kafarat ilma bainahuma. When you go from Umrah to Umrah, it, if it, if it, it erases the sins that are committed between these two Umrahs. Yani. May Allah subhanahu wa protect us from the sin, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Yes, inshallah, hopefully we can make it, inshallah, uh, live soon, bin Allah Azza wa Jal. What is the fidya if we get into an argument with spouse during Hajj days? You know, there is no need for fidya for that. Just need istighfar and may Allah forgive you, Rabbil Alameen. But if you, if you go beyond that and it becomes right now yani messy more than that, then uh, you should really just slaughter an animal or offer a slaughter an animal, inshallah ta'ala, in expiation for that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all safe, jama'ah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.